It's the year 2600, and the New Frontiers program has finally begun. You've got the list of planets to plan dwellings for, and the first one is Venus. The Earth's evil twin sister meets you with a refreshing 800 degrees Fahrenheit and a beautiful sulfuric acid rainstorm. First of all, the heat means living on the surface here is next to impossible, so you immediately put the prospective house several dozen feet underground. The walls, floor, and ceiling must be made of some heat-resistant and durable material, so you make them out of hafnium carbide. Discovered way back in 2016, it withstands temperatures of over 7,000 degrees. Next, you install the air cooling and purification system. It captures the toxic air from the Venusian atmosphere and pulls it through a complex network of filters, delivering breathable air to the dwelling. As an added benefit, the temperature of this air can be easily turned up thanks to what's going on outside. You can create a separate room below the main space and dub it the generator room. The device there will use the almost infinite geothermal energy of the planet to provide the house with electricity. You think for a moment and add a geothermal bathroom as well. There's no water on Venus, but it can be extracted and separated from its acidic clouds. The piping system would include a heating unit for hot water and a cooling unit with liquid nitrogen for cold water. Another separate space is the garden. Since no plants can survive on the surface, you create a spacious hall with bright lights on the ceiling and a sprinkler system throughout the area. You have large patches of soil for vegetables, several acres for fruit plants, and a big patch in the center for a couple of long-living trees like oaks. They'll provide additional oxygen for the whole building. The garden is encased in a shell of hafnium carbide as well, so that the plants don't wilt in the excess heat of the Venusian soil. You check if everything's accounted for and go to your next stop. Saturn. It's a gas planet, but there's a thin yet stable layer that can be called the sweet spot. Its temperature is just right for humans to feel fine. You create a hover platform to build your house on. There's just no solid ground on Saturn at all. The platform's equipped with wind-powered turbines. The winds on the gas giant reach incredible speeds, so it will need to counteract them, at the same time feeding from the hurricanes. The pressure and temperature are just about right in this place, so your main concern is the wind again. You make the dwelling low and looking almost like a frisbee for better aerodynamics. The walls and roof are made from a single slab of sturdy metal so that powerful gusts can't tear the roof away. You also make them several feet thick and add some windows with space-grade glass panes that won't break. Water can be extracted from another layer using a series of similar platforms with built-in pipes. Electricity and heat are no problem either, thanks to the powerful winds. The only problem here is food, but it can be imported from other inhabited planets at first, along with the fertile soil for the garden. You create a space for it on another hover platform for the future. Satisfied with your results, you head to the next destination on your list, Europa. This moon of Jupiter's is covered in a miles-thick crust of ice full of canyons and crevices. But deep below, there's a whole ocean of salt water bigger than all the oceans on old Earth taken together. You take it into account and go for an underground dwelling again. The temperature is freezing, but the closer you are to the hot planetary core, the warmer it is. You place the dwelling as deep as you can to safely extract water from the underground ocean. The walls and ceiling are padded with insulation, and in the cellar, there's a home water purification system that turns salty water into the potable kind. Since there's no atmosphere to speak of, the breathable air is extracted from the ice. As it melts, the water vapor is collected and filtered, then enriched with other necessary substances and delivered to the dwelling. As for food, you go for an unusual solution – edible marine plants and fish. You create a separate tank to cultivate algae right in the ocean, and different kinds of fish can be imported from old Earth and other inhabited planets to breed on Europa. Next stop? Pluto. The tiny dwarf planet, just one-sixth of old Earth in width, has a great potential for terraforming. So you immediately create a big dome for your dwelling. The sun shines much weaker here than in any other place in the solar system, so you make sunlight-enhancing panels all across the dome. They'll allow the surface underneath to receive more light and warmth, bringing the area to a comfortable temperature. 
The ice on Pluto consists of frozen water, just like on Earth. So you build a station for melting it and collecting the resulting liquid into large tanks for later use. There's also a possible liquid ocean deep under the surface. So you add a deep drilling platform, but put a question mark on it. You don't know if it's going to be useful yet. With the area warmed up and well lit, you make a pretty ordinary dwelling like ones we're used to on old Earth and terraform Mars. A couple of stories, carbon or titanium alloyed walls and ceiling for durability, and a fortified cellar. Still, you also add emergency insulation padding that will only trigger if something happens to the lighting dome. If it's breached, the temperature will quickly drop to below freezing. There's also very little atmosphere on Pluto, so breathable air will have to be generated from the ice again. This time, you combine the water collecting system with the air generating facility. While one produces potable water, the other will collect vapor and enhance it with all the necessary elements. You even go as far as to create a weather controlling device. It will heat up or cool down different layers of the produced air and mix them together to create winds and rain clouds just like on old Earth. This will allow crops to grow in a more natural environment, and Pluto might even become a green planet one day. Right above, in the dark blue sky, Pluto's biggest moon, Charon, is hanging. It's half the dwarf planet in size, which makes it a spectacular view. Its climate is almost identical to that of Pluto's. In a fit of inspiration, you create a vacation home for Plutonians. Here, under a similar dome, they'll be able to explore another little world and look at their dwarf planet from the other side. Which is always the same side, by the way, like the Earth's moon, which reminds you of the next destination. Zarmina, previously known as Gliese 581g, is 41 light years away, the longest trip so far. The planet's tidally locked to its sun, which means there's perpetual day on its one side and eternal night on the other. It's not only about light, but heat as well. The day side is much hotter, and the night side is partially covered in ice. Unless we terraform the planet, the most comfortable area to inhabit is right between the two sides, called the Terminator Zone. It's neither too hot nor too cold here, and there's an eternal twilight. The sun is always just above the horizon. The good news is that the atmosphere on Zarmina, although volatile, is rather close to the old Earth's but you still cover the selected area with a protective dome just in case. Human dwellings here don't have to be specially protected from the elements. And there's liquid water, too. You build a pretty generic house, much like the one on Pluto, but then add a few crucial details. First, the weather controlling device. Despite the old Earth-like atmosphere, dwellers will need a stable change of weather to grow crops. Then you cover the dome with moving plates. Living in a constant dust might be pretty depressing, so the plates will move in 12-hour patterns. During the daytime, they will turn to enhance the sunlight, while at night, they'll deflect it back, making the sky dark. After that, you travel to both edges of the Terminator Zone and install geothermal plants. On the hot side, the plant will generate energy for all the settlers' needs and take hot water to use in households. On the cold side, the system will make cold water for the ice. The night side can also be used as a giant refrigerator. Dwellers could store things they need frozen here. To make it easier to access, you stretch the dome from edge to edge and create some simple storage facilities where the night begins in earnest. Hello there! Thank you for coming to the Space Job Agency. We have a whole bunch of departments. Intergalactic jobs, keep it in Milky Way, our solar system rocks, or gases, (laughs) and many smaller ones. Tired of a 9-to-5 routine on our planet? No problem. Let's see if you have any qualifications for newly opened positions. So, we've got here… Oh! An asteroid miner on Mars. As you know, asteroids are some sort of leftovers from times when our solar system was forming. Our scientists believe it's debris left of planet collisions and destruction. Tens of thousands of asteroids are circling our Sun and most of them are between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars. That way, Mars is a perfect location for this job. Those asteroids can hide a lot inside. They're made of magnesium, iron, nickel. We believe some of them consist of oxygen, gold, water, and platinum. We need those for our industries. We have a station with food and everything else you'll need up there. So, you're in a specially designed spacecraft. You start from Mars, 
land on an asteroid, and start mining. Our machinery is lightweight and solar-powered, which means you need less fuel. Sometimes we send robots to do this, sometimes people. Robots don't need food or other supplies. On the other hand, they're not so precise as humans. You use similar techniques as miners on the Earth. Basically, you'll need to scrape the material off the asteroid. The majority of the ore will probably fly off, so you'll have to use a big canopy to collect it. Since the gravity on asteroids is so much weaker than on Earth, you'll have to learn how to use grapples to anchor yourself to the surface. That way, you can move around with little effort. Once you're done with one asteroid and the material is sent to Earth, you're going to the next one. Are you good at sports? I can see there is an ad for a ski instructor on Mars. Mars has four seasons, just like Earth. And winter there lasts around six Earth months because the year there is almost twice as long. The snow there is different because it's made of frozen carbon dioxide instead of frozen water. But don't worry, the best scientists made it completely safe. Snowball fights are not so fun. You get a poor pack of frozen carbon dioxide and a bit of water ice. But snowboarding, sledding, and skiing there are so cool. No, literally, the surface is almost frozen. The snow is not as thick as on our planet, but the surface is very slippery, so it's fun. So, you're gonna work there for six months, but if you plan to make some extra cash, we're transferring you to Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Europa is very cold. Its surface is mostly composed of solid water ice, a subsurface ocean we didn't get to see yet. But, hey, our team of space divers is going there in three months. I'll check if there's a position open if you're interested. They say this ocean might have twice as much water as we have on Earth. Plus, our team of scientists still think this is one of the best spots to build Earth-like cities in our solar system. But until then, you can go as a skiing instructor. The surface is made of ice, so we created our own snow to go skiing. You'll like it there. There are many hills and domes on Europa. Some ridges are 5.5 miles across. So if you want some adrenaline, Europa has little to no atmosphere, so your suit protects you from radiation from the sun. Okay, the next one is a driver in a space taxi on Venus. Tourists love going there, despite that it's very, very hot. It's further away from our sun than Mercury, but it's still hotter. The thing is, the atmosphere there is like a blanket that traps the heat. The planet is scorching, so you can't stay there for too long. The company will provide you with a flying car that looks like a mini spaceship. You'll have to be a pretty good driver because the atmosphere is very dense. And it's also quite windy there. The speed often goes over 220 miles per hour. And it can get tricky with the clouds. You won't be able to see because the wind's moving them all the time, so you have to act fast. Plus, Venus is the planet with the most volcanoes in our solar system. Much of its surface is covered with volcanic deposits, making it hard to land and find a safe spot to land. If you accept this job, here's a tip. It's better to stay in the air. The view is amazing. Speaking of volcanoes, you can probably join our team of space volcanologists. As an assistant first, of course, but later, we'll see if you can take a better position in an intergalactic team. For now, you can stay in our solar system. We presume Mars, Venus, Pluto, and Jupiter's moon Europa have active volcanoes, but there's still no proof of that. The spots we know about for sure are moons Io, Triton, and Enceladus. Moon Finder. We have a department that's looking for new moons, even outside our galaxy. There's also another one where you get to visit and explore moons in our solar system. It has more than 200 moons, so you certainly won't get bored. If we're talking about a planet where you can't even land, like gas giants Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter, you'll visit their moons directly. All major planets have moons except for Mercury and Venus. You'll have to visit these planets first and try to find their moon. Moons are awesome. For example, Dactyl is a moon that doesn't orbit a planet, but an asteroid. Before this, we didn't even know asteroids could have their moons. 
Hyperion orbits Saturn. It has an irregular shape, and we believe it's probably a part of a much bigger, ancient moon that got destroyed from a collision in the early stage of our solar system. It has a low level of density, almost half that of water. And what about Callisto, the oldest one? It orbits Jupiter, and its craters are 4 billion years old. Callisto helped us understand so much about our solar system. Space Jeweler <laughs> If you want to leave our solar system, you can visit what we call Diamond Planet. It's 41 light years away from Earth, located in the Cancer constellation. It's twice as big and dense as Earth, but almost eight times more massive. Its parent star contains way more carbon than our Sun, and this planet probably contains carbon too. The pressure and the temperature are huge, but we have a unique technology to deal with that. It's covered with diamonds, so your job is to collect it and make some amazing space jewelry. You can visit more interesting planets as a space jeweler, like one where it rains rubies and sapphires. The storms there are pretty crazy, but you only get to collect gems scattered across the planet after it's over. If you're more into making something out of glass, there's literally a planet where it rains glass. It's located 63 light years away from us. It's a little bigger than Jupiter, and you'll be amazed by the planet's atmosphere. It has a stunning azure color because it's mostly made of silicate. The wind there is crazy. It hits 5,400 miles per hour. For comparison, the fastest one we've experienced on Earth was 254 miles per hour. Oh, and the last one, Explorer, on the mission called mm -hmm. Planet 9. Beyond Neptune, you'll see many small worlds peacefully dancing in harmony and the stubborn one that's still hiding, the Planet 9. We've been looking at it for a very long time. Our scientists think it exists because they noticed gravitational force affecting a small group of objects with clustered orbits. Planet 9 probably orbits our Sun in 7,400 years. It's six times as massive as Earth. It's either a gas giant or some sort of mini-Neptune, or even a rocky super-Earth. It's well paid, but I must warn you, it's a mission of your lifetime. We don't know when you'll be able to go back. It's far away. Neptune is the starting point of our investigation. It's a gas world, so you can't land on it. So you'll have to go to one of its moons called Triton. It's made of nitrogen ice and rock. You'll be fine. Just watch out for geysers there. They erupt on the crust, and then the atmosphere blows them away and we're still not sure how dangerous they are. And you'll have to wear a special suit because that's the coldest space object in our solar system we know about. So, are you accepting any of the offers? There are many different conditions on other planets and moons that could affect how your pet would evolve there. Take gravity, for example. On a bigger or denser planet, gravity would be higher, meaning that life would evolve to be shorter, sturdier, and perhaps with multiple limbs for structural support. On a lighter planet with weaker gravity, life could hop, soar, and glide more easily, and would be more likely to evolve a lighter, taller build. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun, a dusty, cold, desert world. Mars is also a dynamic planet with seasons, polar ice caps, canyons, extinct volcanoes, and evidence that it was even more active in the past. Gravity on Mars is lower than on Earth, and it's farther from the Sun, so we would see less sunlight. Mars also has no protective magnetic field due to its thin atmosphere, exposing everything to radiation. Sometimes, strong winds create dust storms that howl around the whole planet, and the dust continues to settle for months after. Your pet dog on Mars would probably have a taller, robust build to compensate for poor gravity and would have bigger eyes to better perceive the far-off sun. To protect itself from radiation, your dog would have to switch its pigmentation from melanin to carotenoids, which give carrots, tomatoes, and oranges their color. So the dog would probably have orange skin. Since Mars has weak gravity, your cat would probably be lighter and would jump more to get around the place. It would also have longer legs. Jupiter is called a gas giant, 
the planet is covered in thick red, brown, yellow, and white clouds. The clouds make the planet look like it has stripes. Living on the surface of Jupiter might prove to be challenging. Since there's no actual surface, the planet consists entirely of gas. But it doesn't mean it's just a giant cloud hanging in space. If you venture through its atmosphere to deeper parts, the gas becomes denser until it turns into liquid. So one layer of Jupiter is an ocean made of hydrogen instead of water. With high pressure, extreme temperatures, and a fluid environment, we'll have to draw some inspiration from deep water dwellers who deal with the same conditions but on a smaller scale. Your cats and dogs would be big isopods with shells to protect them from Jupiter's radiation. Like its fellow gaseous neighbor Jupiter, Saturn is a gargantuan cloud of hydrogen and helium with no solid land and powerful winds. Like Jupiter, it gets tighter within, but its core is much smaller. Its iconic rings are made of a myriad of ice particles, so nothing could live on them, unfortunately. Saturn's volume is greater than 760 Earths, and it's the second most massive planet in the solar system, about 95 times Earth's mass. Saturn's average density is less than water, so this behemoth of a planet could float in a bathtub if there were one of a suitable size. The only way to move within Saturn's thick fog is by flopping around like a jellyfish. Your dog would probably have an umbrella-shaped bell to propel itself up and no skeleton so that it wouldn't be crushed by the pressure. Your cat would have jellyfish tentacles to move around. Life is tough on Mercury. This tiny planet is closest to the sun, so the sunlight here is seven times more powerful than on Earth. No sunscreen would be able to manage that. Mercury is about two-fifths the size of Earth, with a similar gravity to Mars, or about 38% of Earth's gravity. This means that you could jump three times as high on Mercury, and heavy objects would be easier to pick up. Mercury's temperature is extreme, swinging between a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. It's all accompanied by constant meteor showers and quakes. As a bonus, there is a very thin atmosphere and no air to breathe. Flesh and bone could never handle these severe conditions. So instead, your pets here would be made of something similar to refractory metal, like titanium. There'd be no need for a respiratory system, so their pretty metal faces would be without a nose. And their eyes would probably look like thick sunglasses to protect them from all this sun exposure. If there's anywhere harder to live than on Mercury, it's Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun and is Earth's closest neighbor in the solar system. Venus is the brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon, and sometimes looks like a bright star in the morning or evening sky. The temperature here is a whopping 880 degrees Fahrenheit, and the atmosphere is so thick, it creates a greenhouse effect. The surface is dry and full of surprises like volcanic eruptions, hurricane winds, and lightning. And as a cherry on top, the pressure here feels like you're one mile underwater, giving you a never-ending headache. It would be hard to imagine your pet living on Venus. The only things that could possibly survive there are anaerobic bacteria. Venus eats away at everything, even metal, making quick work of any human spacecraft. And Venus's atmosphere contains phosphine, which is toxic for anything that breathes oxygen, but means life for microbes. Icy, dark, and plagued by strong winds, Uranus and Neptune are mostly made of cold liquids, methane, water, and ammonia. Methane makes Uranus blue, and it has faint rings, while Neptune is dark, cold, and very windy, as it's the last of the planets in our solar system. It's more than 30 times as far from the Sun as Earth is. Neither of them has a solid surface, and their atmospheres slowly merge into the water around the planet's core. To boot, gravity on Neptune is stronger than on Earth, and applies more pressure on everything. With such powerful gravity, your dog would be shorter, and your cat would be stockier, with muscular bodies and thicker skins against the cold. And considering the fluid environment, your pet's best bet is to become like a cosmic whale or manatee floating around the blue planets. Pluto is not very big. It's only half as wide as the United States. Pluto is smaller than Earth's moon. This dwarf planet takes 248 Earth years to go around the sun. If you lived on Pluto, you would have to wait 248 Earth years to celebrate your first birthday. One day on Pluto is about six and a half days on Earth. The farthest planet-like object from the sun 
is appropriately freezing cold and covered with ice, with weak gravity and a flimsy atmosphere. The Sun, from Pluto, is nothing more than a dot on the horizon, much like the Moon for Earth, so there's not much going on in terms of light. But scientists suggest that there may be a water ocean under Pluto's surface and some nicer weather. Let's take notes from Earth's creatures with built-in antifreeze, like some insects and fish. Low gravity makes the muscles and bones shrink and the space between vertebrae expand, making your pets taller. Their posture would also change, since their spine, for the most part, would be out of a job. So they'd probably be tall, thin, and somewhat spider-like, with spindly limbs and a curved spine. On other planets beyond the solar system, the boundaries between plants and your pets could be blurred, and your pets might merge with plant life. Your pets might become tree-like, with beating hearts attached to their bodies, or with feet to move to better positions as they compete for light and water. You could also have a rabbit that spends most of its time staying still, photosynthesizing, and only running away if threatened. Or a massive dinosaur-like horse that splays itself out on the ground to get nutrients directly from the soil and obtains extra energy with the help of plants on its back. Cooperation could lead to some fascinating pets, such as a sea of amoeba acting as a single jelly-like mega-creature, thousands of voracious shrimp-like carnivores forming a single organism that devours anything in its way, or a web of intertwined trees that collect water in wide pitchers at the top of their canopies. Getting oxygen to muscles is a key for your pet's endurance. Here on Earth, octopuses use a copper-based molecule in their blood to shuttle oxygen, making them more sluggish than mammals and birds that use iron-based hemoglobin. Scientists have speculated about other types of oxygen transport that could make animals fitter. In atmospheres with more oxygen, we might see a pet monkey that can fly without ever having to stop for a rest. On cold planets and moons without much sunlight, such as the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, your pet dog might have to get by with chemical energy rather than take it from the sun. Also, in worlds without light, such as the depths of Enceladus's oceans, there might be little need to evolve eyes. Pets would probably sense their environments using other means, like gills and vibration sensors. We all remember seeing the Apollo lunar rover on the moon built for space missions in the 70s. Besides transporting astronauts for certain explorations, they were used for taking pictures and collecting soil samples for scientists to study. The vehicle was designed by Boeing, the company famous for building airplanes, and cost around 38 million bucks to build. The kind of loose change you'd find today in Elon Musk's couch. In the far future, technologies will be so advanced that a regular car for the moon will behave like a regular SUV we have today. It'll have a sleek look and might be produced by some famous car manufacturers available. Back then, the lunar rover used a T-shaped throttle to move the car left, right, backward, and forward. The futuristic one can be voice-controlled and require minimal human control. And we can't leave out the Earth roof. Hey, you really don't need a moon roof on the moon. Anyway, the moon's driving conditions are not that extreme compared to Mars or other planets. It's hard to believe that the first landing craft to enter Mars was Viking 1, launched on August 20, 1975. It arrived at Mars on June 19, 1976. But decades later, Curiosity, which had six legs and six wheels attached, took the stage as the cute robot explorer. It was designed for the rough terrain, so in the distant future, a human-operated vehicle can have a similar design for people who want to cruise by the Mars sunset. For any human-designed car to work on planets other than the Earth, they have to be electric or anything else that can produce an unlimited supply of energy. Gas-powered vehicles won't work in the vacuum of space, and certainly not on any planet other than our own. It can be powered by the strong sun and convert the energy to run the vehicle. The interior has to accommodate the extreme conditions on the planet, since the atmosphere is very thin and unbreathable. It has to be very warm, since Mars can reach sub-zero temperatures. The matter of gravity isn't that extreme, but frequent dust storms are the problem. The vehicle will also have wheels attached to legs to maneuver around properly, since the terrain is difficult to get around in. Now, my two cents here? Well, I think an all-leather interior with six-way seats front and back will be nice. Adding a 12-speaker sound system with RU Sirius FM radio is a must. 
Did I mention the earth roof? Yeah, I did. And don't forget the 6040 fold down rear seats so you'll have plenty of room to haul your camping gear on your weekend escapes. Meanwhile, it's still possible to have a panoramic glass view of the interior in a project like a tour bus on Mars. There are plenty of locations to discover, like the tallest mountain in our solar system and the snowy carbon peaks. The Red Planet can also have an express train ride that can take you from one place to another. It'll be one of those luxurious cabins that will take you from one landmark to another since Mars becomes colonized and established. The train will also be electric-powered or powered by another power source. Mars is a place where it's possible to have all kinds of vehicles, since the conditions aren't that different from Earth's. Just don't go outside without a helmet. If we designed a vehicle for Mercury, then get ready for bright light from the sun, in which case we would need to add industrial visors and blackout strips around the glass so that the sun won't get to us. At least, we won't have to worry about the heat, since Mercury isn't the hottest planet in our solar system. Well, the temperatures can reach a soaring 800 degrees on a warm sunny day and drop down to minus 300 degrees at night. The vehicle will have to have multiple layers and coatings to withstand the conditions. And it will most likely have spider legs to move, since rubber wheels will melt instantly. And to save itself from damage, it'll need to dig underground to hide from the sun and atmosphere, just like a crab or those spiders that create hatch floors. Driving a vehicle on Pluto will be very challenging, considering that it's the furthest planet from the sun. Now, Pluto is technically not a planet anymore, but it's still a large enough mass to explore. Temperatures there can reach below 400 degrees. A mere jacket won't cut it. The vehicle will need super insulation to keep the operator warm and fuzzy. Methane ice surrounds the land and covers the mountains. Gravity is also an issue since it's very weak, which will make you float in the air. Now, designing a vehicle for Pluto will be tricky. The key for it to move and not freeze will be how the legs move. It'll also have legs like the one on Mercury, but will have a lot of heat generated to keep warm. The weight is enough to keep this vehicle in place. However, that can't be said for Neptune, the windiest planet in our solar system. It's impossible to breathe in the atmosphere, and the atmospheric pressure will crush you. Designing a vehicle is challenging, considering the many external factors, and will have to be pressurized to counter the external atmosphere. It will also need a special coating to counter the harsh temperatures. And because Neptune is extremely windy, it would need some sort of anchor to keep it in place. Something like a large drill that shoots from the belly of the car and digs underground. It will also have spider legs to move around, but they'll behave in a similar motion to how a camel walks. That way, it can maintain its center of gravity. Now, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, with temperatures reaching 1,000 degrees. The pressure will push your vehicle like a can, so it needs proper internal pressure to balance it out. This car will require all the upgrades for countering the heat. It will need proper coating, no glass, and even a special color to reflect the heat. Nothing can actually stay on the ground for too long, so spider legs won't really work. It'll need to hover slightly above the ground and float around. Now, Saturn is the second largest planet in our solar system and has a very windy upper atmosphere and very strong gravity. The rings around it are made up of ice materials that can range from the size of a pebble to the size of a school bus. The pressure is so strong that you'd be crushed the second you reach its atmosphere. Designing a vehicle would be very challenging and weird. It'll need the best technology for withstanding the crushing pressures and harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be large and composed of many internal layers. Since the upper atmosphere is windy, the vehicle will have to remain on the ground for as long as possible. Scientists don't know much of what the surface looks like, so the vehicle will have to be prepared to move on solid surfaces, liquid, and anything else in between. I think it's called slop. It'll need mechanical arms to maneuver through the possible rugged terrain and multiple legs like a centipede. Those arms can pick up things and move them out of the way if it faces some obstacles. The long body can also detach itself and break into smaller pods for a quick escape. From what, we don't yet know. No human can step foot outside even if they wear protective gear. Robots will have to be deployed to test how human bodies can withstand the conditions. 
Jupiter has harsher conditions than Saturn, with the red spot being the most dangerous area on the planet. It's an extremely large area that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for years. The vehicle will resemble that of Saturn, but extra heavy-duty. Scientists also don't know what's happening on the surface except for the crushing atmospheric pressure. The vehicle won't be able to move on the surface if it were to pass through the red spot, so it'll have to dig underground and move underneath. For that, it'll require a huge drill and many self-automated drones and vehicles that can be deployed from the main vehicle to help with digging and surveying. Once underground, it'll have legs that will help it crawl and a giant drill nose to dig further. Many of the body parts can also break off into smaller pods to get through certain terrains, but can be easily reattached. The craziest place where we can launch a vehicle is the sun. There's no way to imagine it except being self-automated. Any human on board won't make it halfway in the journey. The launch will have to be from Mercury in a protective facility sheltered from the harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be made out of the best resources to withstand the extreme heat and gases and won't last more than a couple of minutes once nearby. It'll most likely resemble a satellite and float around to take some footage for us to study. It'll probably cost trillions of dollars, but the results will be worth it, won't they? Get your closet ready. We're moving to Mercury. Your mission is to find out what you need to wear there to feel comfortable. So, Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun in our solar system. It's pretty hot here, about 800 degrees Fahrenheit, twice as much as your kitchen oven can produce. You need a heat reflective suit like this. It looks like foil for duck roasting. The shiny, almost mirror-like surface reflects the heat rays and keeps everything inside from getting baked. That's you. This suit is designed to get to the hearts of volcanoes on Earth and can withstand up to 1,470 degrees Fahrenheit. That's twice as much as at the equator of Mercury. Oh, and bring an oxygen tank. Otherwise, you won't be able to breathe there, and you need to strap some heavy dumbbells to your legs. Mercury is smaller than Earth, and gravity is almost three times weaker here. So you have to increase your weight almost three times to feel comfortable. It gets extremely cold there at night, so you need to stuff your thermal suit with insulation. But even that won't save you from the cold. It's three times colder than at the North Pole. Plus, Mercury's atmosphere doesn't protect you from solar radiation as well as Earth's. So, you need to wear thick lead plates under your suit for protection. But the best thing to do is just evacuate from this planet. The next one is Venus. Although it's called Earth's twin sister, the scenery here looks frightening. A hot desert with volcanoes and clouds so dense that you can barely see the sun. These clouds contribute to the greenhouse effect. So, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, 890 degrees Fahrenheit. But the usual heat reflective suit won't help you this time. The atmospheric pressure here is 92 times higher than on the surface of the Earth. That's like diving 3,200 feet underwater so the air on Venus will just crush you. To survive, you need an airtight suit made of titanium or other sturdy materials. On Earth, we use an atmospheric diving suit like this to withstand the intense pressure underwater. It's like a mini submarine in the shape of a human body, and it's already equipped with an oxygen tank. Yes, the air on Venus is not only unbreathable, it's also toxic. The next planet is Earth. Just look out the window and decide for yourself what to wear today, okay? Let's go to Earth's satellite, the Moon. A few people have been here already, and they were wearing pretty big spacesuits. The main thing is to bring an oxygen tank. It's contained in a backpack along with the life support system. Even though it's cold, there's no atmosphere, it's almost a vacuum, and there's no air particles to take heat from your body, so you won't freeze instantly. Your suit itself should be airtight and keep the atmospheric pressure inside. The lower the pressure, the lower the temperature the fluid can boil over. In space, fluids from your body can evaporate in seconds. You don't want that, so you should wear a spacesuit. It'll also save you from dangerous solar radiation. The moon is defenseless against it. And the gravity here is six times weaker than on Earth. So you can jump six times higher and lift six times more weight. It makes sense to take a little weight with you, so you don't feel as clumsy as the first astronauts. Next up, Mars. 
In summer, you could walk around here in shorts and a t-shirt. The highest recorded temperature here is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. In colder times, you'd have to wear a sweater and a warm jacket here, maybe even two. The average temperature here is slightly colder than the coldest point on Earth. But the atmospheric pressure here is frustrating. It's 170 times less than we're used to. Take the altitude at which commercial airplanes fly on Earth. Multiply it by three. The conditions there are very similar to those on Mars. It's cold and there's no oxygen to breathe. Without a spacesuit, you'd last two minutes at most on Mars. So you need an airtight spacesuit on you all the time on the surface of Mars. NASA scientists are preparing a new generation of spacesuits that will allow astronauts to climb, crawl, and bend without difficulty. You'd feel like a real athlete on the surface of Mars. The gravity there is three times weaker than on Earth, so you could easily lift an animal the size of a tiger there. Don't forget to put a spacesuit on it, of course. Now, let's fly through the asteroid belt further into space and arrive at Jupiter. It's the largest planet in our solar system, and it's a gas giant. That means there's no solid surface, so you can't even stand there. Although, hypothetically, you could jump into Jupiter. Then you'd keep falling all the way to the planet's core. Suppose you're standing on a platform just above the surface of the planet. The first thing you feel is the force of gravity. It's 2.5 times stronger here. You feel it pulling you down, and you can barely even jump up. So it would be nice to equip your spacesuit with an exoskeleton to support your body and help you move. Plus, it's incredibly cold. You'll feel the cold at about negative 229 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface of the clouds of the gas giant. And what makes things worse is the constant wind. It can reach speeds of up to 900 miles per hour, almost twice as fast as the speed of commercial airplanes on Earth. That kind of cold wind will instantly draw heat away from your body, so your spacesuit must be really thick and warm. But the pressure at the top of these clouds is almost the same as on Earth. Technically, you could even take off your helmet here if it weren't for the lack of oxygen and severe cold. Maybe Saturn promises better conditions. Another gas giant. The gravitational force here is almost the same as on Earth, so nothing will constrain your movements, except for a massive spacesuit. It's even colder here than on Jupiter and the pressure here is about the same as about 15 feet underwater on Earth. So, the spacesuit not only lets you breathe and stay warm, but keeps your eardrums intact. Hey, hold on tight! You just almost got blown away by a gust of wind over 1,100 miles per hour. That's not unusual on Saturn. That kind of wind on Earth could get you from one coast of the United States to another in just two and a half hours. The only option to warm up here is to jump down to the center of the planet. The closer you get to the core, the warmer it gets. But the pressure rises at a tremendous rate. In just a few seconds of freefall, even the toughest titanium suit will be crushed. Let's finally step onto a solid surface, Titan, Saturn's moon. It's 1.5 times the size of our moon and 80% heavier. And its surface is mostly composed of water, ice, and rock. The pressure here is a little bit higher than on Earth. You wouldn't feel any discomfort if it weren't extremely cold. Titan is 9.5 times further from the Sun than Earth, so our star can barely warm this moon. The air here is mostly nitrogen, just like on Earth. But oxygen is completely absent here, so it's impossible to breathe without a spacesuit. There may be a huge ocean beneath Titan's surface, Saturn's gravity heats up this moon's core enough to make the ice melt. Plus, it must be extremely salty, which means it can remain liquid even at very low temperatures. The next two planets are Uranus and Neptune. So Uranus holds the record for the coldest planet in our solar system. The temperature here is about negative 224 degrees Celsius, so bring the warmest spacesuit you have. They say if you jump to the center of Uranus, at one point, the pressure becomes so high that it turns hydrogen into a crust of ice. And if you get even lower, you can see the rocky core. Neptune, in turn, holds the record for the strongest winds in the solar system. It's an ice giant, just like Uranus. So the dress code here is the usual. A super warm spacesuit, 
a tank of oxygen, and a heating system. So far, we don't have the kind of spacesuit that would help you survive on any of the gas giants. But if you get to the core of Neptune, it gets too hot. Its temperature is almost the same as on the surface of the Sun. Hey, listen up! Do you want to lose weight fast or gain more mass in just a few seconds? Forget all about diets and sports. We have an out-of-this-world way to do it. Space travel! And now I'm taking you to the heart of our solar system, to the sun. Hold on and bring your shades. There's no solid surface here, just hot liquid plasma. So take your heat reflective suit and stay on the platform just above the boiling surface of the star. On Earth, you weigh 135 pounds. But here, on the Sun, your weight is about 3,600 pounds. That's like a small sedan or a hippo. Hey, just saying. It has to do with gravity. The bigger and denser a space object is, the stronger its gravitational pull and the heavier your body feels. The Sun is 99% of the mass of the entire solar system. But although the star is 333,000 times as heavy as Earth, it's also much bigger. That's why gravity is only 27 times stronger on its surface. You can't stand up straight here. You get pulled down by gravity. And if on Earth you could lift 135 pounds of your own weight, here you can only lift a small pumpkin. Happy Halloween! Moving on, Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, is very hot about twice as hot as the maximum temperature in your kitchen oven. You jump down onto the rocky surface of Mercury and step on the scales. They show only 51 pounds compared to your real weight of 135 pounds. Mercury is almost 17 times smaller than Earth, but its core and crust are very dense. So the gravity here is only 2.5 times weaker than that on our home planet. It means you can jump 2.5 times higher here, and you feel much stronger. You can lift a big gorilla, but don't forget to make it wear a spacesuit with an oxygen supply. When night falls on Mercury, the planet cools down incredibly quickly. The temperature drops to three times as low as at the North Pole. So let's get out of here before you freeze completely stiff. The next planet is Venus. Oh, there's a nasty smell. It's the sulfur dioxide in the air. It would also smell like this near a volcano on Earth. You get on the scales and 122 pounds, almost as much as on Earth. No wonder Venus and Earth are called twin sisters. This planet has almost the same size as ours and only 20% lighter, so it has almost the same gravity. But you couldn't live here because Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, and the atmospheric pressure on its surface is 92 times as high as what we have on Earth. You'd only feel the same pressure if you dive 3,000 feet underwater on our home planet. Without special equipment, you'd be crushed at such a depth. Your spacesuit is made of titanium to withstand this kind of pressure, just like an atmospheric suit for deep sea diving. And it weighs about 830 pounds. It's like carrying the weight of a motorcycle. That's why you feel weaker here than you do on Earth. But moving on to our home planet, or more specifically to its satellite, the Moon. Several astronauts have been here before. You might have seen videos of how awkwardly they moved around, sometimes even falling. That's because gravity on the Moon is six times weaker than on Earth. Your solid 135 pounds of weight turns into 22. So now, you weigh like a plastic shopping cart. On the bright side, you can now lift six times that weight. You can flip a car or lift a pony. You can probably even lift the lunar rover that's still standing here left by the last moon mission. One of the astronauts, Alan Shepard, hit several golf balls here. And one ball weighs less than a half an ounce on the moon. Hey, maybe you can use all that power to clean up the stuff people left here. That's about 250 tons, including rovers, broken space probes, lunar module sections, golf balls, and the like. Nah, let's do the cleanup later. Now we're going to Mars. Hey, you're the first human on the surface of the red planet. And the first thing you do is weigh yourself, of course. Ah, 50 pounds, almost three times less than on Earth. It's even less than the weight of a capybara, a big rodent from South America. That's because Mars is 50% as light and 10 times as small as our home planet. And since gravity is weaker here, you become three times stronger. You could lift two of your friends. But this kind of gravity is actually a problem for people. We're planning to colonize Mars. But our muscles are used to the constant gravity of Earth. They won't work at their full capacity on the red planet. This will cause health problems for the astronauts, so they'll need to exercise all the time or tie weights on themselves to become heavier. 
They'll have to carry at least 10 20-pound dumbbells to get close to their real weight and keep their muscles toned. Now, a quick trip to Jupiter. This is a gas giant. Hey, again with a gas. And it doesn't have a solid surface. All you see are dense clouds. So it's probably best to stay on the platform. Jupiter is 317 times as heavy as Earth, so the gravity here is much stronger. Your scales show 340 pounds. That's like the weight of a big wild boar on Earth. Now, you can barely stand on your feet in your spacesuit. You feel very weak. The maximum weight you can lift here is 60 pounds. That's as much as a husky dog weighs. Let's take a look at Jupiter's moon Europa. You stand on the scales and see 18. Yep, gravity is so weak here that you weigh like a garden gnome. At the same time, you can easily lift 1,000 pounds. That's like a horse or a grand piano. With that kind of strength on Earth, you could flip a school bus or lift a small car over your head, if you wanted to. Moving on, Saturn, another gas giant. Hold on tight, whoo winds here can reach 1,100 miles per hour. Such a gust of wind could carry you across the United States from one coast to another in just two hours. Hurry up and get on the scales. 144 pounds. It's a little more than you weigh on Earth. That's why you feel a little weaker, like after a good workout at the gym. Saturn's moon, Titan. You might want to stick around a bit longer because here you feel like a real weightlifter. You can lift seven grown-ups in your arms. Or a great white shark. Just be careful with those teeth. And your own weight here is about 17 pounds, like a domestic cat. Maybe a fat tabby. Uranus is the coldest planet in our solar system. It's 10 times as cold there as in a freezer. The scales show 120 pounds. You can lift a truck wheel here. The last planet in our solar system, Neptune. It's 17 times as heavy as Earth and 4 times its size. And the strongest winds ever recorded blow here. The number on the scales is 150 pounds. Yep, you've gained a little weight. But the same would happen if you took a dumbbell in your hands on Earth. Now, how about moving to more unique space objects? For example, a neutron star. This is one of the heaviest and densest objects in the universe. A neutron star has the weight of the sun, but it's so small that it would fit in Manhattan. But this space object has a solid surface, so you can land your spaceship here. The neutron star's weight and density makes gravity incredibly strong here. Your 135 pounds on Earth turn into 190 plus 11 zeros pounds here. You'd be flattened like a pancake on a neutron star. You wouldn't even be able to pick up a match here. A regular sewing needle would weigh 140,000 tons. That's like 2,000 Boeing 737s. Next in line is a black hole. Well, we don't even have a number to describe your weight here. Black holes are the densest and heaviest objects in the universe. They lie at the centers of galaxies and can weigh millions and billions of times more than the sun. They're so heavy that they warp space-time. Once you're in a black hole's gravitational field, you can never get out of there. And the gravitational pull increases with every inch you get closer to the center of the black hole. If you were falling into a black hole and extended your arm forward, the force affecting your fingers would be much stronger than that pulling on your elbow and your hand would stretch like spaghetti. Your weight is infinite here, and your strength is infinitely small. Don't even hope to lift a single atom or photon of light here. Yeah, that's enough. Let's go home. You accepted an offer to participate in an experimental program that'll take you and your colleagues to different planets in the solar system to see how humans can live there. As a volunteer, you dedicated your entire life to this study. You're 25 years old, and your destination is Mercury. Your colleague, Ryan, is 45. He'll be based on Pluto. Nora, 18, will go to Jupiter. Jeff, 65, will go to Mars. And Vivian, who's also 25, will head to Neptune. Each of you will have a unique chemical compound to boost your lifespan before reuniting. You're all in the launch pad and ready for takeoff. Each of you sits in the cockpit of your spaceship, and it blasts off right to your planets. Even though Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, it's not the hottest. That honor goes to Venus, but it is the fastest planet to orbit the Sun. On Earth, a year is composed of 365 days, but on Mercury, you'll only have to wait about three months to celebrate the new year, 88 days to be exact. Your team's concept of time will change drastically. 
A part of Einstein's theory of relativity is that time can be affected by acceleration and doesn't flow steadily. It moves slowly for objects that are in motion, rather than a stationary observer. It's also affected by the gravitational pull. The closer you are to a large mass with strong gravity, the slower time will be. People can't perceive this phenomenon. Scientists estimated that the difference is around 90 billionths of a second over 79 years. But at different planets with different gravitational mass, the differences might be visible. Astronaut Scott Kelly went to space, while his twin brother, who was six seconds older than him, remained on Earth. When Scott returned, the gap extended to six seconds and five milliseconds. You arrive in your dormitory and unpack your stuff. Outside, you see the wasteland and the temperature is above 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But at night, the temperature drops to a whopping negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's because Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere to trap any heat to keep the planet warm like a desert. The magnetic field has solar winds from the sun that create strong tornadoes with hot plasma. After settling in and placing all your fabulous sci-fi books on the shelf, the ground shakes and knocks down some stuff. Mercury's surface has active tectonic plates that cause earthquakes. It's just something you'll have to get used to. You're able to have a video call with the rest of your colleagues for a quick catch-up. Ryan is on Pluto, billions of miles away from you, and has the worst reception. Pluto is considered to be a dwarf planet and one of the coldest places in our solar system, with temperatures reaching negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So Ryan doesn't really leave the dorm. He takes his webcam and shows you and everyone else what's outside his window. There are mountains higher than 10,000 feet covered with methane ice. Pluto needs 248 years to orbit the sun, which means it'll take Ryan the most time to celebrate New Year's. No human can last for such a time on Earth, but the chemical enhancements make it possible. On this day, Ryan will have to wait 90,520 Earth days for New Year's. With gravity, he might age much slower than anyone on Earth. After he shows everyone around, the youngest one in the experiment, Nora, vlogs her new setup in the solar system's biggest planet, Jupiter. Jupiter is so giant that more than 1,300 Earths could fit inside it. That's like 1,300 grapes versus the size of a basketball. And even though it's that big, the planet completes a rotation around its axis in just 10 hours. So a day is considerably shorter here than on Earth. She shows you around her dorm, which resembles a fun playground filled with entertainment. The whole complex is sturdy enough to withstand the extreme winds that can reach more than 335 miles per hour. The people in charge of the experiment were smart enough not to place the complex in the Great Red Spot, an area with a hurricane-like storm that has lasted more than 300 years. And this spot is twice the size of Earth. Jupiter needs around 12 Earth years to make a complete orbit around the Sun which is 4,307 days to be exact. This would mean that Nora would have to wait 24 Earth years to be 20 years old, technically. But Jupiter's gravity is a lot stronger than on Earth's, which means she might age twice as fast. After showing everyone around, Jeff, the oldest one, begins giving everyone a tour of his place on Mars. It's called the Red Planet because it's rich in iron minerals, which might rust. His bunker is classy and feels the most luxurious over all of the others. And it has the best view as well. You get to see the highest mountain in the whole solar system, about three times higher than Mount Everest. Olympus Mons is also a volcano, as if being the tallest mountain wasn't already something extraordinary. Mars needs 687 days to orbit the sun, which is a little less than two Earth years. It may not be the quickest in the solar system, but it's not as extreme as Pluto. Mars also has weaker gravitational force than Earth, but with 25 hours a day, he may not feel the time difference compared to everyone else. Vivian jumps in late in the call to show around her place on Neptune. She used to live near some hills and mountainsides, so the windiest planet in our solar system isn't that challenging for her. It has a rocky core like Earth and an uninhabitable atmosphere. Neptune is blue because of the absorption of red light by methane in the hydrogen-helium atmosphere. She shows everyone a view from her panoramic window, and you can see all 14 of Neptune's moons and some cloud formations. A whole day on this planet is just 16 hours. Vivian would have to wait 164 Earth years for Neptune to orbit around the Sun, which is 59,860 days on Earth. 
beyond any ordinary lifespan for humans on Earth, but a giant tortoise could be okay with that. But with everyone using a special chemical compound, the experiment could be conclusive. Gravity is also strong on Neptune compared to Earth, so she might age just as fast as Nora on Jupiter. After the video call, you take a tour around the complex and find out that other people stay with you in different bunkers. And the same goes for your colleagues on the other planets. 1,000 years later. You've forgotten what Earth looks like. You've forgotten what the atmosphere felt like and even the wind brushing against your skin. But you've made your place pretty cozy with so much plant life and cloned animals from Earth in the bio chambers. You completely forgot about the mission at this point and suddenly got a notification about a video call to update everyone about your progress. You set it up and wait for everyone to log in. After about a minute, no one responds. You haven't heard from them since the last video call a thousand years ago. But then, one by one, everyone joins the video conference. The chemicals in everyone's body, which is enough to extend your lifespan, doesn't affect your body physically. It doesn't make you age at the same rate as on Earth, but it slows it down quite well over 1,000 years. Not everyone looks the same. Ryan was 45 years old on Earth, but he's only aged four years with Pluto orbiting the sun four times in a thousand years. He's now 49 years old, but if he were on Earth, he'd be 1,045 years old. But since he was on Pluto with weak gravity, he didn't physically change as drastic as predicted. Nora was 18 when she went to Jupiter and is still the bubbly girl she was 1,000 years ago. It takes 12 years for the planet to orbit the sun, which means she's now technically 30 years old on Jupiter. But with Jupiter's strong gravity, she now looks 60 years old. Jeff landed on Mars when he was 65 years old. And if it takes 687 days for a complete orbit around the sun, then that would make him 596 years old at the moment. Instead of looking extremely old, the weak gravity on the red planet made him age slower relative to the time spent. He looks to be around 80 years old. After landing on Neptune, Vivian, who was your age, is now only 31 years old on the blue planet. It takes 164 years for it to make a full rotation, making her quite old. And with Neptune's gravity just as strong as Jupiter's, she jumped in age and looks like she's in her 70s. You reveal that you're 4,147 years old on Mercury. Since it only takes 88 days for the planet to revolve around the Sun, you're now technically the most senior amongst them. But Mercury's weak gravity makes you look like you're in your 40s. If you were floating in space, no one would be able to hear you whisper, talk, or even scream in horror at seeing a giant asteroid coming towards you. It's not only that you'd be far away from Earth, but sound needs space to travel through. Sounds are just vibrations of molecules and atoms in some medium like water or air. Your body will pick up sound waves through the ear canal and to the eardrum. Vibrations we receive then transform into electrical signals so our brain can understand and recognize them. Frequencies of sounds humans can hear are between 20 to 20,000 hertz. Sound travels four times faster in water because molecules are closer together than in air. Naturally, it travels faster through steel than both water and air. The loudest natural sound on our planet is one made by an erupting volcano. Not 100% certain, but scientists believe the eruption of Krakatoa in 1983 was probably the loudest sound humankind ever had the chance to hear. It exploded with enormous force, destroyed its island, and released 20 million tons of sulfur into the atmosphere. People even heard it 3,000 miles away. It would be like someone producing a sound in New York and people hearing it all the way in Ireland. Sound can take many forms, but humans are most familiar with it in the form of pressure waves that move through the air. Sound goes more slowly through heavy gases and colder air. It travels faster through lighter gases, for example, helium. There's no water or air in space, so the sound doesn't have anything to travel through. Our atmosphere consists of 10 trillion trillion atoms, which is like dense soup creating a way for sound to travel. And there are only 10 atoms per cubic meter up in space. That means 
Space is empty. And silent. But it wasn't always like that. The universe is 10 to 20 billion years old. It appeared as a result of the Big Bang. It wasn't an explosion that started from just one single point, but rather space appearing everywhere in the universe at the same time. Back then, the whole universe was like a hot ball of plasma. It was much thicker than today, so the sound could pass through it. As the universe was forming, it produced shock waves, and they, in return, produced a cosmic rumble, way deeper than things our ears can normally detect. These are the actual and the first sounds the universe ever produced, at the stage when it was still forming. Scientists decoded them and pitched them up to a version we can actually hear. As time went by, the universe was stretching. Today, it's a lot wider, emptier, and quieter. It's good for us, though. If sound traveled through space with ease, we would constantly hear loud explosions, crackles, moans, and other sounds space bodies make out there. The sun isn't silent either. Here's the sound of its vibrations created by its loops, waves, eruptions, and other activity. The sun creates trillions and trillions of watts of sound energy, something like pulsation, low heartbeat. It helps researchers discover what's going on inside of the sun and understand its layers. If it wasn't muted for us on Earth by a lack of air in space, it would be like hearing a jackhammer all the time. If you and your friend were taking a walk on the surface of the moon, you wouldn't be able to hear each other talk. No air, no sound. But that doesn't mean the moon itself doesn't produce any sound. When the first spacecraft landed on the moon, it caused crashes which later led to moonquakes. Scientists took a chance to measure vibrations going through the moon to figure out its internal structure. They realized they caused vibrations that lasted longer than they expected and longer than any similar vibrations on Earth. It was like those moonquakes were producing the sound of a ringing bell. When we have earthquakes, moisture in the ground acts like a sponge. It absorbs the energy of the waves spreading around until it ends their effects, which is why water eventually stops the earthquake. The moon is dry, more like a solid rock. Moonquakes are less intense, but there's no water to stop them, so vibrations just go back and forth through the moon. The solid rock stops them at some point, which is when the ringing stops too. Let's see what happens with the sound on different planets. Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn are mostly made of helium and hydrogen. These gases are way lighter than the atmosphere on our planet, so your voice there would generally come out in a higher pitch. But each planet has its layers that make differences in sound. Neptune has its murky depths, Uranus its methane clouds, but they're both freezing, made of gas, and have ice particles in their atmosphere. Saturn, also a gas giant, boasts wild, raging storms. Saturn's biggest moon, Titan, is the only one known for having a real atmosphere. It's thicker than the one we have on Earth. It's very cold there, and it rains liquid methane. In 2005, researchers sent the Huygens spacecraft that managed to record incredible audio you might find familiar. The sound of winds, but billions of miles away from us, on Titan itself. If you were there, you might even hear the sound that reminds you of a waterfall. In reality, it's flowing liquid methane. Moving to Jupiter, it doesn't have a solid surface either. It's made of gas that becomes denser the deeper you go. At some point, it even turns into a liquid. The sound is different in each of those layers. Jupiter is actually pretty noisy and has bizarre sounds. It creates intense radio storms with powerful lightning bolts. While there, you'd hear their echoes of echoes, just going back and forth. Mars, its atmosphere is way thinner than Earth's, which means there are not many molecules for sound to travel. Winds can get pretty fast, like our hurricanes, but on Mars, they would feel like a gentle breeze. You wouldn't necessarily hear the storm, though. You'd maybe hear the dust as it gets picked up and banged against your spacesuit. In the thin atmosphere, your voice would be much quieter, and it wouldn't travel far. Someone could be standing next to you and screaming, and you'd probably hear nothing. 
Low density air actually makes our voices sound higher pitched, but the cold temperatures, like on Mars, slow down the sound so it would balance out again. Your voice there would sound a bit distant and blurry. And imagine listening to an instrument like a guitar or piano there, like some muffled melody from a dream. Sound on Venus is kind of the opposite of Mars. Venus has a dense atmosphere, much denser than ours, something between water and air. There, you'd hear sounds like when you're underwater. The environment is a bit different with 900 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 tons of atmospheric pressure. But let's say you have a magical spacesuit that protects you from getting crushed or scorched. While on Venus, you'd hear thunder. 40 years ago, a spacecraft successfully landed on its surface and managed to go almost an hour before it shut down. It picked up these amazing sounds of strong winds. If you started talking on Venus, your voice would first hit the lower pitch because of the dense atmosphere. But it would then sound higher because hot air increases the speed of sound. It would be kind of distorted and muffled together with the sounds of thunder around you. Mercury is a rocky body with no atmosphere, so standing on its surface and talking would be like trying to talk while floating in space. Useless. Those are almost vacuum conditions, which would make you think Mercury has no sounds at all. Still, you can hear them, though not in the air. The rocks. Put your ear against the ground. Maybe a Mercury quake is coming. The universe is a place connected by light. Light can go anywhere from any spot in space, but not the sound. So not only do we have a planet that supports life, but offers a wide palette of sounds. Even without us, it wouldn't be a quiet spot. A light breeze gently caressing treetops, earthquakes, volcanoes, deserts. The ocean with its waves on the surface and scary sounds deep below. Up there, it's a quiet mystery. But down here, it's true magic. The ground shakes and you hear a loud cracking sound. Oh no, the dome is failing. Everyone runs to their escape pods to evacuate. People are pushing and shoving. The Earth-like atmosphere in the dome is going to be compromised and you'll be exposed to the thin elements on the surface of Mars. Everyone rushes to put their helmets on. The crack is getting bigger by the second and people are panicking, trying to get on the escape shuttles as quickly as possible. In the chaos, they all jam into the wrong ships and there isn't any room for you. Red warning lights begin to flash in the dome and a voice rings out, telling everyone to put their helmets on. The Martian atmosphere is only minutes away from rushing in and humans won't be able to breathe otherwise. This is just your luck. You only just arrived on Mars. As the ships zoom off into the distance, you wonder what you should do. You call out for help, but no one answers. Suddenly, a robot guide rolls up behind you, and you hear a faint noise coming from its speakers. It says, no one can hear you because the atmosphere on Mars is so much less dense than on Earth. It also has a lot of carbon dioxide, which absorbs sound waves. Even if a loud concert was happening just 30 feet away, it would sound like it was miles away. Would you like me to assist you with anything? You ask it for help, and it shows you a 3D layout of the entire dome. You can see a few other shuttle stations, so you decide to aim for them. Unfortunately, you're going to need to get to the opposite side of the dome to reach another shuttle station. Just as you begin to panic and wonder how you could get there, the robot transforms into a bike and tells you to hop on. You get in and cruise through the city, looking at all the empty buildings and streets. The crack is getting even bigger, and tiny pieces of the dome begin to fall from above, like snow. When you arrive at the other station, the last few people are boarding the only shuttle. You chase after them, desperately trying to get their attention. As you ding the bell on your bike, though, it barely makes any noise at all. Their ship pulls away before they can notice you. You ask why sounds aren't working, and the robot explains that you can barely hear high-pitched noises on Mars. The carbon dioxide makes high-pitched noises, like bells and chirping birds, almost impossible to hear. If only you were still on Earth, they might have noticed you. The robot tells you that there's one last chance to escape. He transforms into a tiny spaceship. You get in, and he flies through the crack in the dome out into space. It's going so fast that you should be back on Earth before long. Just as you're starting to relax and enjoy the sights of space, you see a red light flashing on the robot. 
You ask it what's wrong, but you get no response. Suddenly, you realize that you can't hear anything in space. Sound travels in waves, and it needs something to move through, like air or water. Space is a vacuum with no air, so you can't hear any sounds at all. The spaceship suddenly changes direction and blasts off away from Earth. You try to steer the robot in the right direction, but you can't figure out how to get its attention. The ship charts a flight all the way to Venus. As you get closer, the turbulence kicks in. Venus has winds faster than any tornado on Earth. You keep getting swept away, trying to find a safe space to land in. The robot manages to keep a steady course, despite the wind throwing it all over the place. You can already feel the heat through all the layers. Finally, the robot spots a small cave in the distance and attempts to land there. As soon as the robot touches ground, it morphs into a spacesuit you can wear, so you're safe in the extreme environment. Today's forecast in Venus? Heat. Extremely boiling temperatures all day and night. Expect clouds of sulfuric acid and gale force winds. The atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide, so you can expect your voice to drop deeper too because of the planet's dense atmosphere. It's only the second planet closest to the sun, but it's actually the hottest. Its atmosphere traps the heat from the sun and keeps it around the planet. It's actually so hot on Venus that it could melt lead. If you were cruising by with the spaceship, the whole thing would melt in a matter of minutes. Luckily, you have this indestructible robot armor. You try to ask the robot how to get back, and your voice sounds crazy. Your vocal cords vibrate slower here than on Earth, which makes the pitch lower. But at the same time, the speed of sound on Venus is a lot faster, making it more squeaky. Then, the high carbon dioxide content in the air creates a weird effect that tricks your brain into thinking that the sound source is small. Overall, you sound something like a cartoon duck. You look out across the horizon and see many hills and mountains scattered across the plain. But the robot tells you that many of these are volcanoes. Venus actually has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. Scientists discover more than 1,600 only on the surface, which could mean there are even more than that still undiscovered. Yeah, maybe being here all day isn't such a good idea. And not just because of the heat. A single day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days. In fact, a day on Venus is longer than a year, because it only takes 225 days for it to complete a rotation around the sun. It's hard to understand each other, but you eventually manage. The robot tells you that it just got lost, and that you'll be back on Earth in no time. While walking around the cave, you realize that you're actually inside a volcano. You tell the robot to hurry up and get you back home before it erupts. It's clearly not very good at navigating space, though, because it's not long before you end up somewhere else. You're now on Titan, Saturn's largest moon. The moon is so large that it's even bigger than Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. The spaceship arrives in the atmosphere, which feels and behaves similar to Earth's. The only noticeable difference is the orangey haze hanging in the air, which makes it a lot more difficult to see. As you descend towards the moon, the robot detects signs of cyanide gas all over the surface and fluffy clouds made out of iced methane. You land on a soft spot and set about trying to get the robot to take you back to the right place. At least this time, you're not sweating. The robot transforms again and begins to scan the surroundings. The atmosphere is around 60% thicker than on Earth. Walking around feels like you're wading through maple syrup. There is a really high nitrogen content in the air, so things sound surprisingly similar to how they do on Earth. You tell the robot you really want to get home now, but it comes out as a loud, raspy shout. This is because Titan has more nitrogen than Earth, and because sound travels a bit slower. Luckily, you can still understand each other here. The robot tells you that it needs to absorb a bit more energy from its solar panels before taking off. So, you have a look around. This moon is one of the only things in the solar system that has fixed bodies of liquid like rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. You can understand why the robot got lost now, given how similar Titan is to Earth. Titan even has liquid cycles, with rain, evaporation, and condensation. This isn't water, like back on Earth, though. The main liquid here is methane. Scientists think that there may be volcanic activity, but instead of molten hot lava spewing out, it's water. Other planets, like Mars, have ice on the peaks of their mountains and evidence of water beneath the surface. 
but nothing is as close to Earth as Titan. Some scientists believe that this moon could be our next home billions of years from now. The Sun's temperature will increase by then, making the Earth's atmosphere uninhabitable. By then, Titan's cool temperatures will be good enough to create stable oceans and sustain life. The robot finally gathers enough electricity to fly away, so you can head home. It'll be nice to have a normal conversation where your voice doesn't sound like an exaggerated cartoon. Whew. You're strapped in a spaceship that'll take you all the way to Pluto for your galaxy backpacking trip. It's the longest journey from Earth, and without any shortcuts, so you'll have to get quite comfy. It's recommended for everyone aboard to have at least 8 hours of sleep at night. Astronauts in the International Space Station have little rooms suitable for one person with special sleeping bags and enough room for personal belongings. If they don't, they'll float, bumping into each other. It's a good thing the journey to Pluto will only take you a few days, so you can manage to have your full 8 hours of sleep for the rest of the trip. After a few days, you finally arrive at Pluto, and a bus takes you to the hotel. The dwarf planet is one of the darkest places in the solar system, reflecting very little light since it's located far away from the sun. You look out the window and see some decent landscapes with mountain ranges around 10,000 feet high. But instead of your snowy peaks like in Switzerland, it's methane ice. You have a smartwatch that can tell you the atmosphere characteristics outside. Pluto is filled with nitrogen and methane. After a couple of hours, you finally make it to the hotel and check into your room. You're surprised that you booked one day only. One of the first things you'll notice is the weak gravity, which makes it pretty hard to sleep. Then, finally, after enjoying a full day, you're ready to hit the sack. But the day isn't technically over. A solar day, when the planet rotates around its own axis, needs around six Earth days. So your 12 hours of fun and exploration was like enjoying just an hour on Earth. If you think that's long, then don't bother waiting 248 years to celebrate New Year's. That's the time Pluto needs to orbit the Sun fully. After a while, your biological clock adjusts to conditions on Pluto, so you end up sleeping for more than 72 hours to feel fully refreshed. You check out the next day, Pluto's next day, and fly off to Neptune. This magnificent blue planet may seem appealing, but it's extremely dangerous. But why not? You like the adventure. You get a fantastic view of all the 14 moons of Neptune while waiting for room service. You're somewhat jet-lagged and decide to sleep for a few hours. Even though you chose to take a nap, you end up wasting the whole day doing nothing but nibbling on snacks in the buffet. A day lasts around 17 Earth hours. You were able to fall asleep and slept for about 10 hours, which is more than half a day. And just like Pluto, it takes more than 100 years for it to orbit the Sun, 165 Earth years to be exact. After a while, you adjust your sleeping habits to just around 3 hours to enjoy the rest of your trip. You arrive at the largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter. After landing, you have to commute for another whole month before you come to your hotel. Don't worry, a full day is only about 10 hours. You check in and decide to stay in the hotel. It's not easy to go out since the weather is stormy. One of your programs includes a trip to the Great Red Spot, an area that's been tormented with hurricane-like storms for the past 300 years. The whole spot is twice the size of Earth. Jupiter could easily fit in 1,300 Earths. After a long couple of days enjoying the sights, you get back to the hotel and sleep it off. Since 10 hours is a full day, you're pretty tired and sleep off the entire day. But you couldn't get a proper good night's rest, since the gravity is stronger than Earth's. Also, it wasn't easy going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Eventually, you got your two hours of sleep, adjusting to Jupiter's conditions. Mars is a lot more scenic than the rest. You book a full day at Olympus Mons Volcano, which happens to be the highest mountain in the solar system. It's three times bigger than Everest. Your hotel has a beautiful view of the mountain, and is also the most luxurious and advanced one you've ever booked. The day is 25 hours long, quite similar to Earth's. It means you can get your regular eight hours of sleep. Sadly, outside the dome, there's a mega dust storm that's covering the entire planet. 
As soon as it settles, you take a trip to the polar caps, which are covered in carbon dioxide snow caps. You can feel the temperature drop. Even though Mars is the red planet, it's pretty cold. It needs 687 days to orbit the sun. Your body is starting to feel the changes moving from planet to planet. In many places, you couldn't sleep well or slept in what appears to be an entire day, even though it was regular for you. On Mercury, you check in at an underground hotel that looks like an ant colony and immediately feel the heat coming from the sun. Mercury is the closest planet to the big guy, but Venus is still the hottest. This tiny planet needs 1,408 hours to finish an entire day, which is around 60 Earth days. It's a good thing you arrive during sunset. You have an epic view of the sunset, and as soon as the sun is completely gone, it gets really cold. Since Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere to trap heat, the cold takes over quickly. So you hibernate for a whole month before leaving. You arrive at Saturn, the ringed planet, and see the giant moons orbiting around it. Saturn only has 11 hours in a day. This planet is also extremely windy in the upper atmosphere. And on top of the fantastic view of the moons, you can't miss out on the rings. They're made out of ice and rock particles, ranging in all sizes from a grain of rice to the size of a boat. Billions of these particles are floating in the air, which scientists believe to be the remains of comets and dwarf planets. Next, you travel to Titan, Saturn's largest moon and the second largest moon in the solar system. According to scientists, Titan has the closest Earth-like conditions. It's just colder since it's further from the sun. Besides Earth, Titan is the only place in the solar system with liquid lakes, rivers, and oceans. Methane and ethane lakes are all over the place, so you get on a fabulous cruise around this moon. The atmosphere is also similar to that of Earth and has the right ingredients to start life. You look up at the sky and see clouds forming as it begins to rain. You hide under the shady part of the boat and wait for it to settle. Titan has a methane hydrological cycle pretty similar to the water cycle on Earth, meaning water first evaporates into the sky and then it starts raining. After the fantastic cruise tour, you go to some of the other moons and eventually back to Saturn. You're looking through all the pictures you took as you head back to Earth. The whole trip took you almost an entire Earth year and your body just can't adjust to Earth's conditions anymore. You were so used to sleeping and waking up in total darkness and, in some places, exposed to extreme sunlight. You've slept in different places with different gravity levels, so you don't know what it feels like to sleep on an actual bed anymore. In some areas, you were placed in upright sleeping pods to accommodate for the lack of space. As a result, you're getting constant headaches and keep waking up in the middle of the night, forgetting where you are. Also, you were lighter than you are now for most of the trip, so you lost some muscle mass when you came back to Earth. There are some nights where you don't even sleep and wait for the sun to rise, just like you'd see on Saturn or Jupiter. As a result, your sleep cycles got messed up. Life on Earth got way harder for you after such a trip. So you decide to hibernate for some time to adjust back to our planet's conditions, just like you did on Mercury. If you landed on Mercury, the first thing you'd notice would be how close it is to the sun. It's actually the closest planet to the big ball of fire and the smallest, but it's not the hottest planet. Venus takes credit for that. It takes Earth 365 days to orbit the sun, and it takes Mercury more than three months. Well, 88 days to be exact. The days are boiling hot, with a temperature reaching above 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But on the other side of the planet that the sun doesn't reach, the temperatures drop to negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Mercury's atmosphere can't hold any heat when it's nighttime, just like a desert. Deserts have no atmosphere, which is why they have no moisture and no clouds or rain. If you manage to get from one end of the planet to the other and always stay in between the scorching heat and freezing cold, then you can survive. But oxygen isn't a friend to Mercury's atmosphere. So you just live for as long as you could hold your breath. Plus, there's a magnetic field that has solar winds from the sun that create plasma tornadoes. Venus can heat up to almost 1,000 degrees. 
but gravity is really similar to that of Earth. You can go for walks by the mountains and even go jogging, but the temperature will instantly melt you, so maybe forget about those jogging sessions. The extreme pressure would also crush you like a can. It's like being half a mile underwater on Earth, so you'd only last a few seconds on Venus. The red planet is home to the highest mountain in the solar system, around three times taller than Mount Everest. And it's also a volcano. Despite being called the red planet, Mars is actually really cold. It needs a little less than two years to rotate around the sun, or 687 days to be precise. And almost like Earth, it has 25 hours in a day. The atmosphere over there is very thin, but unbreathable. The planet has loads of dust storms that cover the entire planet and polar caps that are covered with carbon dioxide. You won't freeze in your spot, but you'd need some thick clothing to keep warm. It's possible to last as long as you can hold your breath. On the bright side, though, you'd get to see some incredible views. The solar system's biggest planet is the mighty Jupiter. If Jupiter was the size of a basketball, then Earth would just be the size of a single grape compared to it. It only needs 10 hours to rotate around its axis, which is a lot shorter than Earth's. One of the best tourist attractions is the Great Red Spot, an area with a hurricane-like storm that's lasted more than 300 years. Oh, and the area is about twice the size of Earth. The largest planet in our solar system needs around 12 Earth years, or 4,307 days, to make a complete circle around the Sun. But Jupiter's gravity is a lot stronger than Earth's. Besides the lack of oxygen and winds that can keep you suspended in the air forever, the immense pressure would crush you. Visiting here won't last longer than a few seconds. Pluto is a former planet furthest from the Sun in our solar system and is now considered to be a dwarf planet. And because it's that far, it's one of the coldest places ever, with temperatures reaching negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Definitely bring a jacket. Or two. Methane ice covers the mountains that soar at over 10,000 feet. Pluto needs 248 years to orbit the Sun. It's technically still in rotation, waiting to celebrate New Year's, but it just needs six Earth days to complete a rotation around itself. And, surprise surprise, the air is also unbreathable. Besides the methane floating around, nitrogen is also pretty common. The gravity is weak, so you'd have to hold your breath while floating in the air before freezing like an ice cube. Again, you'd only last a couple of seconds. The windiest planet in our solar system is Neptune. The core is similar to that of Earth. It has 14 moons surrounding it. A day is kind of short compared to Earth. You'd have only 17 hours in a single day. And similar to Pluto, it needs more than 150 years to spin around the Sun. Neptune is also known as the Blue Planet because of the absorption of the red light by methane in the hydrogen-helium atmosphere. So besides not breathing, the pressure can also crush you, just like on Jupiter. No one can last more than a few seconds there. The second biggest planet is none other than Saturn, with rings surrounding it. From far away, its rings look like one big chunk of rock spinning around. But in fact, it's made up of many layers of ice particles and rocks, ranging in all sizes, from tiny pebbles to bus-sized objects. The rings are shaped in such a way because of the gravity around Saturn. A day on Saturn lasts only 11 hours. It's very windy in the upper atmosphere. Saturn also has plenty of moons like Jupiter. And, just like on Jupiter, you'd be crushed by extreme pressure deep in the planet before you can open your eyes. You wouldn't last longer than a few seconds here, either. Titan is Saturn's largest moon and second largest moon in the solar system. It has the closest Earth-like conditions compared to any existing planet or moon, so living here should be a walk in the park. But the cold weather will freeze you. This moon is actually the only place in the whole solar system that has liquid rivers, oceans, and lakes. They're all covered with methane and ethane, and the atmosphere is very similar to that of Earth. It even rains here at certain times. Our moon isn't so friendly either. Because of the lack of oxygen, you can just last as long as you can hold your breath. The cosmic rays from the sun will also affect you, but skipping along the moon craters is actually quite fun. If you tried going to the sun, you'd vaporize in the blink of an eye. The temperatures can reach around 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, and that's just an estimated measurement near the core. There are still the outer layers you need to worry about that'll also leave you in atoms. Your best bet is to hit the brakes and take the nearest exit. 
Estimated time on the sun? Less than a second. Our little blue planet is the only place we can live in where an average human can reach 80 years old. We adapted to many weather conditions that aren't crazy, with the gravity just about right so we don't feel crushed. We can live anywhere from dry deserts to snowy ice peaks. It's the only place that has the perfect balance for us to survive. Scientists hope that one day we can live on planets other than our own. Mars is the closest place that can host us, considering we'd have to build a dome in order to live there. Elon Musk wants to use Tesla bots as the first non-human crew to land there and start building our future homes. The robots can acquire information about the planet and mimic the way humans walk and behave, so it'll let us see what we'll need to worry about. In all cases, humans will need to be suited up in order to come close to any planet. Our bodies aren't designed to face such conditions unless we evolve naturally to fit the environment. The tardigrade is the only animal on Earth that can live in the most extreme conditions, from the deepest oceans to the highest mountain peaks. They shot some of these microscopic critters into space and found out that they can live in the vacuum of space for up to 10 days and return without breaking a sweat. They're probably the only known creatures on Earth that can live the longest on any planet except the sun. Scientists claim that if a large asteroid hits the Earth, then tardigrades can perfectly survive. But humans are simply not designed to live outside of Earth without the proper gear. Why do we look the way we look? Most of it's down to dear old planet Earth. It's atmosphere, gravity, that kind of stuff. When you go on a week-long beach getaway, you get a tan. Basic. But what about living on a whole other planet? One astronaut spent a whole year living on the International Space Station. Zero gravity means no healthy pressure on your body, so his bones got weaker. So did his muscles. It also gave him more space between his vertebrae, so he got a bit taller. And that's only a year. The more time you spend at the beach, the darker your tan gets. So, what if we move to Mars? The first major change you might notice after a couple hundred years is your brand new skeleton. Gravity on Mars is much lower than on Earth, so your muscles and bones would probably shrink not great for surviving on a new planet. Gravity would make us feel our weight differently. If you weighed 150 pounds on Earth, you'd only feel like you weighed about 50 pounds on Mars. You'd need to eat more to get stronger and bigger to make up for Mars's weak gravity. Sweet! Time to grow some larger and stronger bones, organs, muscles, everything. There'd be one more dramatic change. Your largest organ, your skin. It's the most important barrier that protects you from everything. Germs, wind, UV light, looking totally creepy, you name it, it does it. You might just need a whole new skin. How do you feel about orange? Sorry people, green skin is totally sci-fi. Here's the deal, carotenoids offer quite a nice protection against UV light. That's the stuff you find in carrots, sweet potatoes, bell peppers, tomatoes, pumpkins. A Mars farmer's market could make a fortune. The more of these veggies you eat, the more orange your skin's gonna get. If you followed a special diet and wore high-tech gear, chances are, one day, living on Mars might be totally normal. Living on Mercury would be really tough. It's the closest planet to the sun, and it's definitely hotter than Earth, but weirdly, not hotter than Venus. It's really hot during the day, about 800 degrees, but at night, it drops to negative 290. Days on Mercury are kind of crazy. You know, when you finish the day, but you didn't really get a lot done? Problem solved, move to Mercury. A day on this planet lasts about 58 Earth days. That means you'd have a lot of time to get ready for bed, my guess, though, you'd probably get kind of bored. One excellent solution. Somehow, become made of metal, like titanium, nickel, or platinum. Those guys can handle extreme conditions. Life on Venus would be way worse than Mercury or Mars. Pressure might be a tiny issue. You'd probably have one long, never-ending headache. Standing on Venus is like being 3,000 feet underwater. Oh, and that thing we need every moment of the day? Chocolate. I mean, air? There's not a lot of that floating around on Venus. There's carbon dioxide everywhere, 
and the planet's surface is completely dry. That means it's gonna be hot. 870 degrees hot. There are a few species on Earth that can survive the boiling point of water. And maybe if they mutated somehow, they'd survive Venus's crazy heat. 266 degrees is the record so far, set by a species of microbes. So get ready for an epic body transformation. Want to live on Venus? You'd probably have to turn into a tiny microbe just to survive. Luckily, Venus's atmosphere has phosphine, which isn't great for humans, but microbes just love it. But since you're not a microbe, not yet anyway, you'd need to wear special gear to control the pressure and feed you air. It's not looking good. Maybe it'd be easier on Jupiter. Yeah! No, it's got no solid land. This planet's made of hydrogen and helium and is known as a gas giant. Unlike Saturn, you'd probably end up just floating around on it. It's like a giant cloud, and if you ever managed to land, it'd be like walking through a super thick fog. Temperatures fluctuate a lot here. It's freezing on the surface, and the atmosphere can be super hot below the surface. We don't really even know. If you lived on Jupiter, there'd be no spoken languages. The gas planet absorbs radio waves, so even if you could speak, no one would hear you anyway. And there'd be no music, so no dance parties. What's the point? People would have to communicate in sign language. Great, but it's not. The atmosphere on Jupiter is wild. All kinds of winds and gas clouds. You probably wouldn't even be able to see anything. So that's not gonna happen. Still, Jupiter is awesome to look at. It's so big that it can fit all the other planets in our solar system inside it, with room to spare. A trip to Saturn will set you back about a decade, and it'd be a big old waste of time. Saturn's mostly made up of layers of gas. It has no solid surface, so farming, building, or any other normal Earth activities are out of the question. Before landing on Saturn itself, you'd probably want to explore those iconic rings around it. You'd fail, though, because the rings are made of millions of ice sprinkles floating in space. That's pretty hard to walk on. You might have thought that Saturn was going to be a good fit for you. Some layers of this gas giant sphere actually have quite a nice temperature. If you dive into Saturn, you'll get to a layer with liquid molecules and a cool 32 degrees. That's like northern Canada, Alaska, Sweden, except that you can't walk on it. Anyway, it's only one minor layer, and the rest of the planet is insanely cold. So I guess if you still want to live on Saturn, you've got some work to do. No biggie, you just got to turn into a snowball or something. What about Uranus? Time is kind of weird on Uranus, so if you're out that way looking for a nice vacation spot, definitely choose this planet. A two-week getaway on Earth lasts three years on Uranus. There's even a sea if you're up for a beach vacation. The only problem is that it's made of ammonia, that gross-smelling stuff they use for cleaning. But watch out where you land. If you get it wrong, you might end up spending a whole year without any sun. How would you change if you had to spend a whole year in the freezing dark Uranus winter? We'd need bigger eyes to see in the dark, plus more of that thicker skin to keep the cold out. We might even develop a new hearing system, like dolphins have. Neptune. It's another gas planet, but scientists think there's probably a dense core inside. If you took the plunge to live on Neptune, you'd probably turn into a space reptile or cosmic fish endlessly floating around on the surface. Gravity on Neptune is just a little bit stronger than on Earth. Still, it'd be really hard to stay in one place. The wind there is super strong. You'd have to be much heavier to resist it. Time to eat again, woohoo! But this planet's really impossible to live on. Scientists don't even want to send another spacecraft there. Welcome to Pluto. Freezing cold, tiny, and super far away. Doesn't sound too exciting. It's even smaller than our moon. It would be so hard to stay on the planet. No more trampoline parks, people. 
you'd probably have to build yourself a huge machine that would spin you around, sort of a fake gravity machine. Still, you try spinning around all day, you'd need a brand new nervous system to avoid feeling queasy all the time. But Pluto's not all bad. There's a liquid water ocean beneath the surface, and ice mountains. If you got yourself a highly trained crew and a bunch of expensive gear, and regular supplies from Earth, nah, too much hassle. Spaghettification. Wonder if you can choose your own sauce? It's actually something you might experience if you ever tried to live in a black hole. It's the process of squeezing objects, like you, into long, thin cosmic strips. So, good news, you'll get much taller. Bad news, you'll be thinner than a single human hair. Hey, Space Guy Bob here. He's traveling around lifting some weights. Here on Earth, he can lift 150 pounds his own weight. He's not a trained athlete or anything, just an average guy. Time to go! Okay, Bob, let's see how much you can lift elsewhere in the universe. First stop, the sun. Woo! It's so hot! Best to go there at night. Heh, <laughs> just kidding. Anyway, Bob's a robot. He can handle the heat. The sun doesn't have a solid surface, so he won't leave the spacecraft. A 3-ounce donut weighs about 5 pounds on the sun, 27 times heavier. It's all about mass and density. More mass, more density, more gravity. <laughs> Time to blast off, Bob! Next stop, Mercury. Gravity here is way weaker. When Bob jumps on a scale on Mercury, he weighs 2.5 times less. What a beast! Here, he can lift 375 pounds, about as much as a medium-sized donkey. A pretty confused and seriously lost donkey. Hee-haw! Bob's gotta get going, it's getting kinda hot. Mercury is the nearest planet to the Sun, and it can heat up to about 800 degrees. But Mercury rotates super slowly, so at nighttime, it's a shocking minus 274. Venus! Ooh, it's good that Bob has iron lungs, because humans can't breathe normally here. Venus is called Earth's sister because it's about the same size. Our planet's only a little larger, so gravity here is almost the same. Bob can lift his 150-pound clone, and this clone could hold a cute little dog in its arms. Okay, off to the moon! Bob's feeling pretty strong here. Gravity on the moon is six times less than on the Earth, so Bob can lift the lunar rover with ease. Actually, he can lift two, one in each hand. That's about 880 pounds. Alan Shepard is the only person ever to play golf on the moon. A moon golf ball weighs less than half an ounce. One good swing, and that thing is gone. Turns out, there's water on the moon's surface. It's not an ocean or even a bit of ice, just some water molecules. The Sahara Desert has 100 times more H2O than here, but still a pretty amazing discovery. Mars. If you're ever there, you'll feel a pleasant lightness and strength. Mars' gravity is 2.5 times weaker than Earth's, so you could hold your own against professional athletes as long as they stay on Earth. <laughs> Bob can lift a motorbike on Mars, and there's loads of parking. Bob's been hitting the weights pretty hard. Time for a break. Maybe check out the view. Because of the dust and atmosphere, the sunset here is blue. On the horizon, he can see a giant mountain. It's Olympus, the tallest mountain in the whole solar system. Now, let's fly up a little. Phobos, it's one of two moons orbiting Mars. Up here, Bob can barely feel gravity. He can lift a school bus. And if Bob decides to jump, it'll be the longest jump in history, because he'll never return to the surface of Phobos again. Don't open the door, Bob! This is Jupiter, a gas giant. There's no solid surface here. Bob would just fall into a cloud of gas. But Jupiter is 317 times heavier than Earth, so gravity here is actually really strong. Bob's legs feel like jello. It's not even that easy to stand up. The most he can lift is about 60 pounds. Time for a confidence boost. Europa is one of Jupiter's many moons, and Bob's loving it up here. He can lift well over a thousand pounds. That's like an adult horse. With this kind of strength on Earth, he'd be strong enough to flip over a car or even a small bus. 
But Europa's surface feels bizarre. Bob feels almost weightless, and he's a little scared to move. Imagine feeling you might fly away any second. Better start putting on some weight if you want to stay here. All the cake you can eat. Saturn. This one's also a gas giant. Bob's gonna chill on board his spaceship. Here, Bob's almost as strong as he is on Earth. The max weight he can carry is a cool 140 pounds. Now, Bob's not gonna stick around for long. The wind's so strong here. And its atmosphere is full of ammonia. Pretty dangerous, even for Bob. Titan. Like Titanic. No, not really. The second largest moon in the solar system, and there's a lot going on there. Imagine a huge ocean of water hidden under ice and lakes made of strange liquids. There's liquid ethylene, methane, butane, propane. Those are gases on Earth. Even though he can't live here, and he certainly can't chill at the local beaches, Bob can still show off his mad strength. Here, he can lift seven adults, about a thousand pounds. That's like holding a small walrus in your hands, which I wouldn't recommend. Uranus. This place is an icy giant. It's the coldest planet in our solar system. But the weird thing is, it doesn't have a solid surface. Good thing Bob brought an extra blanket. It can get as cold as minus 373 degrees. Gravity's only a bit weaker here than on Earth, so Bob can't show off his muscles. Plus, he's a robot, so he doesn't have any. But he can still lift something as heavy as a small tractor wheel. Hey, nice job, Bob! Neptune. Gravity is stronger here. On Earth, Bob could lift 150 pounds. Here, only about 132. And just like Saturn, the wind is on overdrive, over 1,300 miles per hour. That's even faster than an F-22 Raptor. Pluto. Don't worry, Bob knows it's not a real planet, but it's way calmer here than on Neptune. Bob should set up a gym here for sure. The total weight an average person can lift here is about one ton, and you could jump 25 feet in the air. Pluto Olympics would be so epic. Except too much jumping on Pluto can be dangerous. You don't want to, you know, actually jump into outer space. Way off in the future, humans might want to live on other planets. So Bob needs to do a little exploring outside our solar system. Proxima Centauri b. It's only slightly larger than the Earth, and the gravity here is almost the same. Bob feels right at home. He can easily lift up his metallic co-pilot, who also weighs 150 pounds. Kepler 452b. This planet's only a little bit bigger than ours, but it's much denser and heavier. Gravity's almost twice as strong. Bob can flex all he wants, but he can barely lift two buckets of water. Ooh, maybe time to call the sorcerer's apprentice. But Bob's got bigger problems. Best case scenario, flying to Kepler 452b takes about 26 million years. That's over 50 million years round trip. Better bring some snacks. LHS 1140b. This is an excellent candidate for our future home. But gravity here can get a little uncomfortable. It's three times stronger than Earth's. Bob gets out to walk around, and he instantly feels like he's doing a loop on a roller coaster. His max lift here is his beloved Robo Labrador, weighing about 46 pounds. Neutron Star Bob's way outside the solar system now. Even though it's small, a neutron star is incredibly heavy and has really strong gravity. It's one of the heaviest objects in the universe. Still, its surface has a thin crust of solid matter, so Bob can land his spaceship. But here, our poor little robot is totally powerless. He can't even lift a match or a needle. Bob can't even lift himself up. The gravity's so strong, it flattens him into a robot pancake. Bye bye Bob! Check out that buff dude over there with the orange skin. He's been chilling on Mars for a hot minute, which is why he looks like he used the wrong shade of self-tan. You see, all those carotenoids and carrots, sweet potatoes, bell peppers, tomatoes, and pumpkins are protecting him from those UV rays. The more he eats, the more orange he gets. And as for his sturdiness, It's all about that Martian gravity. The gravity here makes us perceive our weight differently. And if you want to be a boss on Mars, you gotta eat heavily. Like, if a person weighs 150 pounds on Earth, it feels like no more than 55 pounds on Mars. So, overeating can help shorten that gravity to weight gap. Mercury is a whole different thing. It's hotter than Georgia asphalt during the day, but colder than Elsa's castle at night. 
you gotta be made of metal with a high melting point to be able to survive here. But for us regular humans, we'd be toast. Literally. Even though Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, Venus is still the hottest one. Life on Venus. More like life on the Sun's evil twin. The temperature here typically hovers around 870 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Surviving at the boiling point of water, or in the extreme heat of Venus, is a challenge for most Earthly species. Only a select few can endure boiling hot temperatures. Others rush to Starbucks to grab an iced latte with the first beams of the spring sun. So no human being can really evolve enough to survive on Venus. The only creatures that could thrive there are probably tardigrades and those weirdos who put hot sauce on everything. You wonder what tardigrades are? Well, those are minuscule and adorable caterpillar-like creatures that possess remarkable durability. They can endure boiling water, the depths of a sea trench, and the frigid, lightless void of space. Recently, tardigrades were included in a scientific study aboard a spacecraft that unfortunately crashed on the moon. Scientists speculate that the tardigrades may have survived the impact. Hey, would you like to turn into this creature and live on Venus? We're done with terrestrial planets. Let's move on to gas giants. Now look at this dude from Saturn. He's got flippers and not arms. He's got small holes with no external ear flaps instead of regular ears. Most of this gas giant is colder than your ex's heart, as the temperature is about minus 220 F. You can't walk on it, but you can turn into a snowball or an ice crystal if you're feeling frisky. Things are quite similar on Jupiter, so probably turning into a seal and chilling there is not that bad of an idea. At least you can live there rent free. And don't even get me started on Neptune and Uranus. These guys are ice giants with no solid surface. So those sharp clawed dudes you see in movies? Yeah, they don't exist. Plus, these two ain't exactly hospitable to life. I'll stick to my sweet potatoes on Mars. Thank you very much. I hope you feel well rested, because I've got a tough task for you. Don't worry, it's fun. You're going to visit different planets of our solar system and try to run on each of them. Let's figure out where you can run the fastest and where you can barely walk. The fastest man on Earth, Usain Bolt, can run with an average speed of about 23 miles per hour. But his top speed is higher, up to 27 miles per hour. Sadly, we can't all be Usain Bolts. The average person runs at a speed of 6 to 8 miles per hour. But maybe there's a planet out there where you can beat the famous Jamaican sprinter's records. But first things first, what will affect your speed when you run on other planets? For one thing, gravity. Depending on how strong it is on the planet you visit, it'll influence your weight. And in most cases, the heavier you are, the more slowly you run. Plus, on all other planets in our solar system except Earth, you'll have to wear a bulky spacesuit. Without it, your chances of survival there are non-existent. And don't forget about extreme weather conditions on most planets. It's either freezing cold or boiling hot, or very, and I mean it, windy. Anyway, your amazing journey is about to begin. Buckle your seatbelt. The first planet on your itinerary is Mercury. As you sneak a peek at this world through the window of your spaceship, you notice that the planet looks eerily similar to the good old moon. But just a few moments later, you realize it's just an illusion. All over the surface of Mercury, you see craters left by space rocks. Hmm, this may make your task of running on this planet way harder. This and your bulky spacesuit. Duh. But you wouldn't survive on Mercury without this protection. The temperatures on the planet are extreme. 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Hey. But there's one thing that can work in your favor on this unfriendly planet. Let's say you weigh 155 pounds on Earth. Then on Mercury, you'd weigh around 58 pounds. Which means that despite your bulky spacesuit, you can move way faster than you do on Earth. And maybe your speed will even reach 13 miles per hour if you try really hard. The next planet on your itinerary is Venus, also called the Morning Star. While coming closer, you see a world very different from the bluish planet you might have seen in books. Before landing, you have to get through a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. And while your spacecraft is descending, you're watching thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. Venus is often called Earth's twin because these two planets are of similar size and density. No wonder that on Venus, you weigh almost as much as you do on Earth, 140 pounds. 
so your weight is a bit smaller here, but don't forget about your spacesuit. And still, because of almost the same conditions on the two planets, you'd be able to run a bit faster than on Earth, at around 8.5 miles per hour. Your first impression of Mars is that it's freezing cold. The average temperature here is about negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Even from afar, the planet looks reddish. Once you make your first step on the Martian surface, you understand why. The ground's covered with rusty colored dust. The same fine dust is floating in the air around you. Wherever you look, you see golden, brown, tan, and even greenish hues. They depend on the minerals that make up the soil. The size of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's around seven feet thick. Hmm, that can make running much more difficult. On Mars, your weight would be much smaller than on Earth, a mere 58 pounds. This will help you achieve an impressive speed of 12 miles per hour. <laughs> Aren't you a champ? What's that on the horizon? It looks like a tornado. Is it a dust storm? Then it's time to make a run for it. Dust storms sometimes cover the entire planet, and you can even see the largest ones from Earth. And now you are facing a problem. You see, Jupiter, as well as Saturn, is a gas giant. This means that the largest planet in the solar system, and Jupiter is so large it could swallow 1,300 Earths, doesn't have any solid surface. Well, you'll just have to imagine what your running workout would look like if you could run on Jupiter. This planet has an atmosphere that consists of hydrogen and helium gas. During your descent, you admire thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. On Jupiter, you'd weigh 390 pounds. You'd have to break a sweat to simply walk there wearing your clumsy spacesuit. If you could step on the planet's surface, that is. If you tried to run there, your best result would probably be a speed of one or two miles per hour. To make matters worse, it's extremely windy on Jupiter, with the wind speeds ranging from 200 to 400 miles per hour. Do you see those rings? That's Saturn, another gas giant with no solid surface. This planet's made up of mostly hydrogen and helium, and its temperature and density change the deeper you go. If you decided to leave your spacecraft and step on Saturn's surface, you'd just fall into the planet. But from above, it looks as if Saturn does have a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by several layers of clouds. The visible outer layer is made up of ammonia clouds. Under them, there are hydrosulfide clouds. And the innermost layer is made up of clouds of water. Even though Saturn is a gas giant, your weight wouldn't be very different here, around 165 pounds. That's because the planet's gravity is similar to that of Earth. But because of the conditions on the planet, and your bulky, bulky spacesuit, you'd run a bit more slowly there, at a speed of about 4 miles per hour. Before leaving, you admire Saturn's most famous feature, awesome gray, beige, and tan rings. These groups of tiny ringlets are made of chunks of rock and ice, you also spot several of the 53 moons of Saturn. Oh, that's Titan, an icy world bigger than our moon and even Mercury. It's the second largest moon in the solar system. The next planet on your way is a blue-green ball of ice and gas. That's ice giant Uranus. It has this beautiful hue because the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Uranus isn't solid. Hit the brakes! If your spacecraft doesn't manage to stop in time, it'll fly through the upper atmosphere and sink into the icy liquid center of the planet. Hmm, I doubt you'll be able to conduct your running experiment here. So let's just imagine what it looked like. On Uranus, your weight would be around 138 pounds. And against all odds, you could actually reach a good speed here, at least eight miles per hour. If you didn't get caught in a hurricane, of course, Extreme storms occur on the planet in the summer when Uranus is heated the most. Then, hurricanes can spread for more than 6,000 miles. The furthest planet from the Sun, Neptune, is four times the size of Earth, but 17 times as heavy. The blue surface you see when approaching Neptune is actually a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. 
The planet's mantle is made up of water, ammonia, and methane ices. It's the closest thing Neptune has to a surface. And still, there isn't solid ground for you to walk on. So, once again, try to use your imagination. On Neptune, you'd weigh a bit more than you do on Earth, 174 pounds, but your running speed would be just a bit lower than on Earth, around 5 miles per hour. That's the end of your active adventure! Which planet did you like running on the most? You were lucky to find that 6 by 6 foot apartment after all. None of your friends own one. They mostly live in capsule modules where it's only possible to sleep without turning and tossing much. The price for what they call a mansion today is obscenely high and you still fully can't accept it. Tomorrow, you gotta sign that contract and make the down payment. Actually, you had the chance to buy it only because you won that chance in the lottery. This is how you live in 2999, you and the other 100 billion people. Some people, though, invest in numerous new millennium apartment blocks on other planets. The latest real estate trend is to downshift somewhere on Ross 128b, Mars, or even Saturn. You were thinking about it too, but you just love the Earth's atmosphere and nature too much. While you're sipping your morning coffee, a pop-up advertisement hologram instantly fills all the space in your capsule, and it just won't disappear. Dear Earthen, don't miss out on the chance to change your life once and for all. Check out the newest apartment blocks on Ross 128B, Mars, Europa, and Saturn. Invest in your new housing and brand new life. Bus tours available daily. Suddenly, you realize this spam might be your chance. You still have some time before signing that contract. You've got nothing to lose, it's just a one-day tour. After all, 11 light years from Earth to Ross 128B aren't a big deal now. Just a couple of hours on that space bus the agency provides. You'll go there and see that there's no place like Earth, just to make sure you've made the right choice. You rush to the space bus station, and you're just in time. 3, 2, 1, go! The bus pulls out, and two hours later, you're already there on Ross 128B. Wow! It looks like a bit of old-fashioned Earth you've seen in scientific presentations at university. The surface is rocky with some green spots. These must be the forests and meadows scientists are trying to introduce. It does have an atmosphere, although artificial. The real estate agent says it's actually good, no unpredicted weather anymore. Everything is controlled by the dwellers. The only inconvenience is that the better the weather is, the heftier bill you're going to get next month. The UV protection is essential on Ross 128b. Its index is 38% higher than on Earth, so a regular sunscreen turns out pretty helpless. They say this planet is like the Earth twin, but you kinda disagree. There's some vegetation, but it all looks so weird, you feel like you're in a computer game. Next to the apartment block, there's an orchard and a small farm producing organic food for the locals. So you decide to pop in and check how it works. The fruits and vegetables look so odd there. You realize this must be an apple tree, but it has microchips instead of flower buds, and the fruit are cubical. There are apples of all of the rainbow colors. You go forward and stumble on a small rock, one of the few things that belonged to this planet originally and weren't imported from Earth. A butterfly lands on the tip of your nose. You want to touch it, but as soon as your fingers reach it, the insect disperses in numerous pixels. The real estate agent runs up to you, helping you stand back on your feet. She says all the fauna on the planet is still represented in a form of holograms, because transferring it all from Earth doesn't seem possible at the moment. All the fauna elements are tightly connected together, and even the smallest butterfly can make a dramatic difference. With the money you have for the down payment on Earth, you can afford a two-story apartment on this planet. The only problem is tiring commuting to work every single day. Come on, y'all! Mars is ahead! We still have a lot of apartment blocks to show you! Ah, that's the real estate agent calling you. You hop on that bus and sometime later you land on Mars. By $29.99, it looks just spectacular, but a bit too sandy. The scientists still can't bring liquid water to this planet, even though the atmosphere is completely fine. The planet's too warm now because they tried to make it habitable. Even though there are glaciers, all the water instantly turns to gas because of the heat. You spot some large machines up in the sky. The real estate agent says these are some essential pieces of equipment that trap the gas water up in the sky to make Martian pouched water. She hands one pouch to you to try it out. Looks like an air balloon. Weird. You inhale it and… you've never tasted anything like this before. And you still can't understand how that gas quenched your thirst. 
The main plants on Mars are cacti of all forms. They adapted perfectly to its atmosphere, and scientists even managed to blend other plant genes with those of cacti. These tall plants are a Martian type of maple. You can tell it looking at the leaves. Here, there are some pears growing on that large cactus. And you can see mangoes, avocados, and fruits of all kinds. They seem to be thriving. The sun's shining, and they're surrounded by water in the form of gas. It almost feels like home here. While Ross 128b still has to be developed, it's been over 200 years since the first ranch on Mars was made. The real estate is pricier here, though, so you can only afford a nice studio apartment. Looks like a bargain, but it's time to visit another planet. You're headed to Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. You've been to this planet last year on vacation, and you loved it a lot. 1,000 years ago, the scientists thought there was water under its icy crust, and they were right. The crust melted, forming a huge ocean twice the size of Earth's world ocean. And the planet itself has been undergoing various changes over the last millennium. All the cracks it had on its smooth surface formed many small continents. All of them were named after European countries, but you have enough time to visit only one of them, Italy. The continent is surrounded by azure water, and there are endless fragrant lemon trees. People cook pizza with freshly grown tomatoes, though they're as large as Earth's watermelons. One tomato is enough for two pizzas. You look through the Europa brochure to get more information about other continents. On Norway, there are mountains looking very much like Norwegian fjords. On France, there are endless lavender fields. And on the continent of Greece, there are large farms with olive trees. You close the brochure, realizing that real estate here is almost as pricey as back on Earth. No wonder too many people want to live there. Time's up! You've got one more planet ahead. The bus is about to land and there's an announcement. Welcome to Saturn! Put on your swimming masks and dive in to see our ultimate apartment block. The scientists spent over 250 years trying to solidify Saturn, but it was in vain. In the end, they decided to try making the first settlements back in the 2980s when you were a kid. The gravity on Saturn is a bit stronger than on Earth, which allowed scientists to construct large complexes under domes for people to dwell there. In the depths of Saturn's gas oceans, there's a wide variety of fauna – jellyfish, octopuses, even sharks. They look a bit different, trying to adapt to their life on another planet. Their fins look way larger to help them handle incredibly strong winds of 1,100 miles an hour. But the most incredible part is the flora. Saturn's algae come in at at least 3,000 different colors. At least the brochure says so. You can also regulate their intensity and shade with a remote. Two hours later, you're back in your capsule. You keep tossing in your bed. It's the last night here. Tomorrow is the big day, but you're still in two minds. You saw that studio apartment on Mars in your dreams. You ate Martian pancakes topped with cactus maple syrup. The alarm goes off. Congratulations! You're now the owner of your own apartment on Earth. Very few people can make it in 2999, Mr. Sanders. You're holding a set of keys in your hand. A notification beeps on your phone. Lease your apartment on Earth and move to Mars. You won't ever have to work again. You can't help it and begin to smile. This may look like a scene from a cool sci-fi movie or an astonishing painting, but it's actually real-life footage of Mars, the very planet known for its bright rust color. Layers of rock and dust cover the planet's surface. They consist of iron-rich minerals. That's why dust on Mars is mostly iron oxide. It floats in the atmosphere and creates an orange-red haze around the planet. But Mars has some even more amazing things, like these blue speckles on its surface. They look like a wind-sculpted sea of dunes around 19 miles wide. Astronauts saw these dunes at the northern polar cap of the planet. That's a region that covers an area approximately as big as Texas. The blue dunes, formed by winds, are shaped like long, weaving lines. The winds on Mars are relentless and strong. They turn the barren surface of the planet into terrains of grand beauty. These winds are influenced by many different factors. For example, temperature fluctuations to the way the planet's atmosphere circulates. The atmosphere is thin on Mars. That's the reason liquid water most likely can't exist there for any long period of time. That's why, even though Mars is only half the diameter of our planet, it has the same amount of dry land as Earth. A thin atmosphere is also the reason why wind needs to be exceptionally strong and fast to move the sand and form such shapes as these dunes. 
winds usually move at 10 to 20 miles per hour on Mars. Anyway, even though the image looks pretty colorful, the dunes aren't actually blue. The bluish patches represent colder parts, while the warmer regions are yellowish-orange. The images were part of a set of photos released to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Odyssey, a spacecraft orbiting Mars. Mars has numerous sand dunes in different locations all over its surface. Some of them formed a billion years ago, like the ones in the Valles Marineris region. They haven't changed because both the atmospheric pressure and wind patterns there have remained the same. But some things do change. For example, some dunes get covered with frost. Here, the main dune has a series of dark patterns. It may be because frost comes and goes, depending on the season. Mars has four seasons, just like Earth, but they're twice as long as ours. It's because Mars needs around two Earth years to orbit the Sun. Seasons are harsher in the south of the planet than in the north. During southern winter, the planet is farthest away from the Sun. Mars moves pretty slowly, and its orbit is elliptical, different from the orbit of Earth, which is almost circular. Spring on Mars is a season with plenty of dust storms that start in one part of the planet and, eventually, turn into huge storms. They become so large, they blanket the entire planet. Each planet of our solar system has something that makes it special. Jupiter, for example, is not only the largest planet, more than twice as big as all other planets combined, but it also has the biggest ocean in the solar system. Jupiter is made of similar elements to the Sun. They're mostly helium and hydrogen. In the deeper parts of the planet's atmosphere, temperature and pressure increase. That's why the hydrogen gas gets compressed and turns into liquid. That gives Jupiter the biggest ocean, but it's made of hydrogen, not water. There's also a theory that somewhere halfway to Jupiter's center, the pressure increases so much that electrons start getting squeezed out of hydrogen atoms. This allows the liquid to conduct electricity as effectively as most metals do. Jupiter is rotating fast, which creates electrical currents and generates a strong magnetic field. But as a gas giant, the planet doesn't have a firm surface. The planet's swirls and stripes are cold, windy clouds of water and ammonia. Jupiter also has the iconic Great Red Spot, which is an insanely large storm with crimson-colored clouds spinning counterclockwise. Winds there are way faster than any hurricane on our planet. The Great Red Spot has slightly changed throughout time and is currently bigger than our planet. It's 1.3 times as wide as Earth. Scientists have discovered that its roots extend more than 200 miles into Jupiter's atmosphere. A regular tropical cyclone we see on our planet can only extend nine miles from the top to the bottom of the storm. These days, the red spot is becoming smaller and taller at the same time. Jupiter also has dozens of moons and a couple of rings, but unlike Saturn's rings, these are quite faint and mostly made of dust, not ice. Also, there's a salty ocean under the surface of Jupiter's biggest moon, Ganymede. It's hidden below a thick icy crust. It's likely to contain more water than all surface water reservoirs we have on Earth combined. The theory says this ocean is around 60 miles deep, 10 times greater than the deepest point of our planet's oceans. Jupiter and Saturn contain 10 million tons of precious stones. The pressure inside these planets' atmospheres can actually turn carbon into small pieces of diamonds. If you put these diamonds under extreme temperatures and pressure, they can melt. This would probably result in some sort of diamond rain. In the beginning, our solar system was just a swirling cloud of gas and dust. It eventually developed into a spinning disk with the central star in the middle. Almost all planets in our solar system move counterclockwise around the sun. Venus is the only planet that rotates in a clockwise direction, and Uranus rotates on its side. These planets are most likely different because long ago, huge asteroids collided with them and kind of knocked them off their course. There's a chance Venus could be a habitable planet. It's definitely not a place you'd want to live now, not with its sulfuric acid clouds and tremendous atmospheric pressure. It's 90 times greater than that on Earth. At here, insanely high temperatures, the conditions on Venus are very unfavorable for people. At 863 degrees Fahrenheit, Venus is hotter than Mercury, even though it's further away from the Sun. This happens because there's too much carbon dioxide in Venus's atmosphere. It traps heat, which causes the temperature to rise way higher than it's supposed to. But simulations show that around 700 million years ago, Venus might have been a nice place with moderate temperatures and liquid water. 
those conditions were slightly similar to those we have on Earth now. Uranus is not a gas giant. It's actually made of ice. The atmosphere contains methane, which makes the planet look blue. It has 27 moons, two sets of rings, and lots of ice in its atmosphere. A day on Uranus lasts just a little bit over 17 hours. That's how long it takes the planet to complete a single rotation on its axis. But its tilt is so pronounced that most of the time, either one or the other pole is pointed toward the sun. That's why the daytime length at the North Pole is almost half a year. And a year on Uranus is as long as 84 years. If you lived on Uranus closer to its North Pole, you'd be able to see the sun in the sky for 42 years. That would be the summer. After this, the sun would go down, and you'd have to live the next 42 years in the darkness. It'd be the winter on the planet. Neptune is the most distant and the smallest of the gas giants. The gravity on the planet is similar to the one we have on Earth, but you wouldn't be able to stand on Neptune's surface. It's gas, not solid land. Triton, the biggest of the planet's moons, orbits Neptune in a very unusual way. It moves backward compared to the rest of the planet's moons. Triton is also slowly spiraling inward toward Neptune. One day, billions of years from now, it's likely to get torn apart by the planet's gravitational forces and become just a ring around Neptune. This ring will continue being pulled inward until it eventually crashes into the planet. Pluto is a dwarf planet, and a year there lasts 248 Earth years. But even though it's not even a planet, Pluto still has several interesting things to offer, like floating mountains. Pluto's nitrogen glaciers carry countless isolated hills, each up to several miles across. They're likely to be fragments of water ice from the dwarf planet's surrounding uplands. Nitrogen ice is denser than water ice, so scientists think water ice hills float in a sea of frozen nitrogen, just like icebergs in the Arctic Ocean here on Earth. How many people do we need to create a new civilization? And not on Earth, but on Mars and in limited conditions. And if we create this colony and send them off, what problems will they face? How can they survive that far away from home without any support? A recent scientific study sheds light on these questions, so let's take a look at it. Alright, so you want to colonize Mars, right? Well, it's not an easy task. Mars is the fourth most distant planet from the Sun and the seventh largest in the solar system. This lonely red guy is very similar to our Earth. Moreover, before it became a boundless desert, it could well have even looked like Earth now. Millions of years ago, there was water, oceans, plants, and who knows, maybe even life. It would be nice to put all these cool things back there. No wonder we've been talking about colonization of this planet for a very long time. Now, SpaceX claims that their proposed interplanetary spacecraft could deliver 100 people to Mars. The owner of the company, billionaire Elon Musk, talked about creating a fleet that could provide a constant flow of resources to Mars. But how realistic are all these fantasies? Actually, not very much. Before sending people to Mars, we need to solve a number of issues. For example, the incredible radiation exposure, toxic soil, low gravity, low temperatures, and all sorts of other nasty things. And this is just the beginning. It will take at least a couple of decades to create a vehicle that can actually successfully land on Mars and return back. But let's do a thought experiment and imagine that we finally decided to colonize Mars. How will things turn out? Recently, scientists published a new study on this topic. This study is called Minimum Number of Settlers for Survival on Another Planet. The author is Jean-Marc Salotti, professor at the National Polytechnic Institute of Bordeaux in France. His article was published in the Scientific Reports Journal. As you might have guessed, the study was trying to find out how we could colonize another planet. How many resources do we need? How should this colony live? What kind of work should they do? And how long will it take? And, of course, exactly how many people do we need for all of this? Let's try to answer that. Now, imagine that we've moved into a wonderful future. Well, not really. A terrible future, actually. In his study, Salotti suggested that life on Earth was threatened by some catastrophic event, 
So the only way for humanity to survive is to go to Mars or some other planet. In this imaginary scenario, unfortunately, the supply delivery from Earth was interrupted or even gone. Now, the colony has to support itself somehow. Well, here's where we already stumble upon a bunch of problems. For example, we're not sure how well the people in the colony will work together. Hey! Will they communicate with each other like normal human beings? Will they share their time and resources as they should? Humans are constantly ruining things for other humans. I can even bet that it was their fault we had to flee to Mars. But even if we forget about that, how about organizational issues? What equipment do we have? What will we use to extract resources? What skills would we need? You know what? Who cares? In our case, these things don't matter. All that we know is that the colony doesn't have a lot of initial resources and equipment, and the human factor is absolutely unpredictable. So the chances of survival are pretty low, but we need to survive somehow. In this case, Salati describes two things that will have a huge impact on our survival. These things are essentially variables in a mathematical equation. The first one is the availability of local resources. Basically, it means water, oxygen, and all sorts of useful chemical elements. These resources should be somehow mined and easy to use. Fortunately, we're not starting from scratch. We already know a lot about Mars. What resources are there? How can they be used for life support, agriculture, and industrial production? The colony is lucky because all this has been studied at various seminars and published in reports and books over the past years. Thanks to this, we know what will be available to our colony. For example, we know that gases could be extracted from the atmosphere and minerals from the soil. On Mars, we could provide such things as iron, glass, and even organic compounds. The most important problem here is the service life of the equipment that our new Martians start with. They'll have to get as many materials as possible before the tools break. Keeping them in good condition will be almost the most important task. The second thing is the production capacity, or the speed of work. We have a specific list of things we need to do, make some tools for example, and all this must be produced in sufficient quantities before the literal deadlines. Salati says that the most important thing here will be the so-called sharing factor. Imagine one person trying to survive on Mars. They would have to do all the tasks on their own. They would need to find or build their own system for supplying drinking water, oxygen, and electricity generation. We've already seen how this played out in the movie The Martian. This task wasn't easy at all. There's always not enough time, and all of this is just too much for one person to handle. Unless you're Matt Damon, of course. So, surprisingly, we need a fairly large colony. This significantly distributes the burden. Each person spends less effort, gets tired less, and as a result, the efficiency and speed of work grow. This is where the sharing factor comes into play. Now we need to calculate this number. If we want, for example, to build something, how many people do we need to do this quickly and efficiently? How can we optimize the work as much as possible? Well, it depends on the needs of these people, on available resources, random things like weather and so on. But in general, this number can be estimated and calculated using some mathematical functions. Salati tells in more detail about these functions in his article. You can read it yourself if you're interested, but in general, he describes five areas that need to be taken into account when calculating this number. These areas are ecosystem management, energy production, industry, buildings, and the human factor. The human factor includes such things as the upbringing and education of children, sports, games, music, and so on. In the end, it all comes down to two things, how much time we have and how well the people in the colony will work with each other. So, what was the result of all these calculations? In the end, Salati found out that we would need at least 110 people to successfully survive on Mars. This is the minimal number needed to create a self-sufficient civilization. And it will be better if we don't take too many people with us. The more people we take on the spacecraft, 
the more difficult it will be to predict the results. After all, as we've already said, humans are always ruining things for other humans. So it's better to stick with about 110 people. Of course, this is a rough estimate, and there are a bunch of different assumptions and uncertainties, but even this number is already very useful. Now the scientists know how many people is a minimum for colonization of another planet. Colonizing other planets is a very complex issue, and it will take us a very long time to resolve it. It's very unlikely that we'll fly to Mars in the near future. This task may take several decades, or even a century. Therefore, the best solution would be to try our best to save Earth until we can begin to conquer other planets. All right, let's imagine that humans have evolved to survive on very little oxygen. That means the Earth is now a no-go zone for us. And let's say that now we can live only on planets with little to no oxygen. It's time to build new homes on Mercury and Jupiter. So let's explore what life would be like if that happened. As you set foot on Mercury, you'll immediately notice how crazily bright it is. Mercury, being the closest planet to the Sun, is a never-ending summer vacation. Right now, it's scorching hot at a sizzling 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But since we don't need any water or oxygen, our bodies have adapted to the blazing heat and dry conditions of Mercury. Instead of overheating, our skin possesses a special protective layer that helps us handle these conditions. So, we're able to live there without any discomfort. How cool is that? On Mercury, the air is very thin. As a result, the sky there appears mostly dark and empty. The surface, however, is pretty colorful. It can appear orange and golden due to the planet's rocky terrain and the intense sunlight. All this creates some captivating views. Our activities would be super exciting. The gravity on Mercury is very weak, almost three times weaker than Earth's. So, imagine gliding through the air with incredible wingsuits, effortlessly soaring above the molten landscapes. So many possible cool tricks to show off. The buildings in this world are both imaginative and practical. They're made of special materials that can handle the heat and shine with a metallic gold color, reflecting the scorching sunlight. As you can see, our life in this small, hot world can still be pretty exciting. But let's move on to Venus. Now we've got ourselves quite a workload. This is the wildest and wackiest planet in the neighborhood. Temperatures there sizzle at a mind-boggling 900 degrees Fahrenheit. But guess what? Our bodies are cool with it. We can handle extreme temperatures. The winds there are crazy fast, reaching speeds of 224 miles per hour. Amongst them, we spot mysterious dark streaks that refuse to budge. Even scientists are puzzled by these streaks, which soak up ultraviolet radiation. It's like Venus has some secret party tricks up its sleeve. And speaking of parties, the planet is packed with active volcanoes, and they're always putting on quite a show. Molten lava flows and fiery eruptions are our daily dose of entertainment. Venus is similar in size to Earth, so the landscape feels familiar, but with a twist. It has a crazy amount of pressure that would make even the toughest creatures on Earth squirm. But not us. Our bodies are built to handle it, and we confidently strut around Venus like it's no big deal. Our cities shine like beacons, built with materials that can handle the intense heat and pressure. The metallic structures reflect the fiery glow of the Venusian sun. Inside, we've got super advanced cooling systems that keep us comfy despite the scorching temperatures. We surf on streams of molten lava, safely of course, and explore the volcanic landscapes. Pretty exciting, isn't it? But still, how about moving to a more friendly environment? Like Mars. Moving to Mars is one of our biggest goals. Its surface is a colorful canvas with hues of brown, gold, and tan. It's covered in rusting iron, regolith, which is like Martian soil, and dust. We would also be surrounded by volcanoes, impact craters, crustal movement, and mighty dust storms. As we gaze into the sky, we are greeted by Phobos and Deimos, Mars's moons. The sky itself is hazy and painted in shades of red and becomes blue during the sunset, opposite to what we have on Earth. The temperatures on Mars can be quite extreme. Sometimes it's as mild as a comfortable 70 degrees Fahrenheit, while at other times it plunges to bone-chilling lows of around negative 225 degrees Fahrenheit. But once again, let's assume that our bodies have adapted to handle these swings. We've also developed ways to safeguard ourselves from meteorites and asteroids. These guys will be our frequent guests. The thin atmosphere of Mars doesn't provide much protection from them. Out of all the planets, 
Mars would be the easiest one for us to adapt to. Our next candidates, though, are not that hospitable. Living on Jupiter, the gas giant is a whole new level of adventure. Since there's no solid ground to walk on, we've come up with some super cool ways to call this place home. Picture floating cities like gigantic bubbles, suspended in swirling gases and liquids. They're specially designed to withstand extreme pressures and temperatures. To get around, we have jetpacks and hovercrafts. Imagine floating amidst Jupiter's majestic atmosphere, surrounded by cold, windy clouds of ammonia and water. These vibrant stripes and swirls paint the planet with a colorful palette. We zip through the colorful clouds, enjoying a mesmerizing kaleidoscope. Our homes and cities are filled with vibrant colors and shimmering lights. We've even created artificial gravity zones, where we can experience a semblance of gravity and walk with a bounce in our step. But be careful. Jupiter's powerful storms can be intense. Luckily, we have advanced weather prediction technology that keeps us safe. We watch the mesmerizing light shows of lightning dancing across the sky, marveling at the raw power of nature. All this sounds pretty fun, doesn't it? Well, what about the next gas giant, Saturn? Once again, we can live in the skies of Saturn, right among its beautiful rings. Our cities are like big colorful balloons that sparkle and shine with bright lights. Inside, we have large domes where we can freely enjoy everything this incredible planet has to offer. Instead of walking, we use special devices that make us glide through the air, just like on Jupiter. In this extraordinary place, we had to discover new ways to generate power. We use the energy from Saturn's powerful storms. These sources of energy help us fuel our floating cities, giving us the electricity and resources we need to thrive. Saturn has many moons, and each one has its own special features. We've set up outposts on some of these moons, where we can go on exciting adventures and explore their mysterious landscapes. But if living on a gas giant wasn't challenging enough, we also have ice giants in our system. Welcome to the fascinating world of Uranus. Despite the super chilly temperature of negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit, we've come up with clever ways to make this place livable. To create warmth, we can learn from Earth's greenhouse effect. Like a cozy blanket, we can introduce special gases into Uranus's atmosphere that trap heat. Another idea is to build gigantic mirrors to capture and reflect the sun's heat. But let's be honest, it would be quite a challenge to position all those massive mirrors just right. Our homes are designed to withstand extreme conditions. We use dense fluids like methane, ammonia, and water to build structures that keep us warm and cozy. Our habitats provide shelter from the freezing temperatures outside. We may even discover new forms of life that have adapted to the unique conditions of this icy giant. Now that would be chilling for sure. And finally, we have Neptune. It is the cool and distant cousin of the solar system. Neptune's atmosphere is mostly composed of hydrogen, helium, and methane. There's also no water, only lots and lots of ice. But that's fine with us, right? So it's time to construct habitats. Let's envision another sky city. After all, who doesn't love the idea of floating cities amidst the clouds? Imagine gazing out from your sky city, observing the mesmerizing hues and swirling storms of this ice giant. The vibrant colors of the atmosphere would paint a breathtaking backdrop for our daily adventures. We'd explore the mysteries of Neptune's moons, delving into their icy landscapes and uncovering the secrets they hold. Hey, a world where humans don't need oxygen or water to survive doesn't sound that bad. We'd soar through the skies and roam vast landscapes. The only limits we would have would be the limits of our own imagination. So stay tuned for more captivating what-if scenarios. Colonizing other planets is like the ultimate cosmic adventure. It's a challenge that's captured the imagination of humans for centuries. And it's something we've always dreamed of doing. One of the most popular candidates for this role is Mars. And this isn't surprising. Mars is a rocky planet that is similar to Earth in many ways. And it even has evidence of water on its surface. This makes it a prime candidate for human colonization. Many scientists and engineers are working on plans to send humans to Mars and establish a permanent settlement there. But 
What about the other candidates? There are many planets and moons in our solar system, so why not colonize something else? For example, Ceres. Ceres is the ultimate cosmic treasure trove. It's a dwarf planet, not a full-fledged one, just like Pluto. It's located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This dwarf planet is the closest to the Sun, and it's adorably tiny. The entire planet is about the same size as the state of Texas. So why choose it? Because Ceres may be a rich source of valuable resources. The surface of Ceres is covered in craters and other geological features. And scientists believe that beneath its surface, it has a thick layer of water ice. Which means that deep underground, it may have an ocean of liquid water. If this is true, Ceres could be a valuable resource for future space missions. It could potentially provide a source of water for human exploration of the solar system. So, can we colonize it? And if so, how do we do that? Actually, many scientists and space enthusiasts have proposed this idea. To colonize Ceres, we'd have to use the same methods used to establish colonies on the Moon, Mercury, and the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn. Don't worry, it's not that hard. We just need to figure out how to adapt to a very thin atmosphere, to extreme temperatures and pressure and, well, all the other nasty stuff. But let's stay hopeful. At the end of the day, it all comes down to resources. We'll need water, minerals, silica, and other raw materials. All this would help us to create a self-sufficient colony. And luckily, Ceres is full of these things. So first of all, we could locate the places of residence inside the craters of Ceres. We could build domes there that would protect us from all sorts of dangerous things, like radiation. We could also mine regolith in the asteroid belt. Regolith is a residual soil that appears as a result of cosmic weathering of the rock. Basically, it's something like the surface layer of soil on the moon. Why do we need it? Well, because we could use it to 3D print the base layers next to the ice, so that our bases would be located near the water. We could then use these base layers to print other structures, like houses. We could also collect ice and organic molecules to create water. And by combining water with regolith, we would get soil in which we could grow plants and food. Wonderful! There's also another option. A colony could be created underground. That is, right next to the icy crust of the planet. Now, if in the future we'll be some kind of super cool scientists, we could try to accelerate the rotation of Ceres, which sounds crazy, but would be pretty beneficial. It would help us to create artificial gravity inside the underground colonies. And speaking of gravity, all of these things may sound cool, but let's discuss the difficulties that lie ahead of us during colonization. To colonize Ceres, we would need to overcome a number of challenges. To begin with, we need to develop technologies that will help us even get to Ceres. We need some kind of ships that would be capable of long flights into deep space. For them, first we need to create some kind of nuclear thermal or nuclear electric traction, and maybe an even more advanced type of fuel. Then we'll also need technology to help us sustain life in this small rocky world. That is, tools to extract and use local resources. Also, since there's no atmosphere on Ceres, we would have to wear spacesuits and live in pressurized habitats. And this is only the beginning. Living on the planet itself won't be an easy task either. For example, what about extreme temperatures, or radiation, or the mentioned incredibly weak gravity? The latter is definitely one of the biggest problems. The gravity of Ceres is only 3% of the Earth's. You wouldn't want to accidentally fly into outer space while playing football, would you? But the fact that any jump could send you on an endless journey isn't the only problem. Even if you somehow stay on the surface of the planet, you'll experience the same symptoms and problems as astronauts who hang out on the International Space Station. For example, loss of muscle mass, 
decrease in bone density, deterioration of vision, problems with the cardiovascular system. Wow, who would have thought that gravity is so important? So therefore, if we wanted to survive on Ceres, we would need either a bunch of doctors or some kind of artificial gravity. And don't even get me started on how low gravity will slow down production and work. And of course, we can't go anywhere without discussing money. Colonizing Cirrus would cost us a huge expense, especially taking into account all of the above. And yet, despite all these things, Cirrus still stays one of the best candidates for colonization. For example, Cirrus contains lots of methane and ammonia. They can be used as a manufactured fuel or a nitrogenous gas. Or you can just mine it there in order to colonize Mars and Venus. Even low gravity has its advantages. Thanks to it, it will be very easy to launch spacecraft from Ceres. We'll waste much less fuel, which means that transportation from Ceres to other planets would be much cheaper and more efficient. So even if Ceres doesn't become our permanent residence, it can become a good transport hub, something like a spaceport. We could use it as a base for mining all sorts of useful things from the asteroid belt. Then, we could transport all these resources back to Mars or Earth. And it can also become a refueling station for ships traveling further beyond the solar system. Sounds cool and pretty sci-fi-ish, doesn't it? But it seems that any attempts to create a permanent base in the asteroid belt will have to wait. Colonizing other planets is a difficult and complex task. It'll require the cooperation and expertise of many different people, and it will involve developing new technologies and overcoming many challenges. Before we go to Ceres, we need to build infrastructures on the Moon, Mars, and somewhere in between. Otherwise, any attempts to colonize it would be prohibitively expensive and would most likely fail before future missions could even reach it. But the more colonies we create, the more likely it is that sooner or later, we'll build another one on Ceres. This would not only open the asteroid belt to economic exploitation, it would also serve as a stepping stone to the outer solar system. This, in turn, could lead to colonizing the moons of Jupiter and beyond. In other words, the rewards of colonizing Ceres could be great. Not only would it allow us to explore and understand this fascinating world, but it could also provide us with valuable resources that could help us to further explore and settle the solar system. Life on Ceres would likely be challenging, but exciting, as humans would be making a new home for themselves and exploring the mysteries of the universe. Just imagine all the new planet-themed restaurants and shops we could have. Welcome to Ceres Mart, where everything is out of this world. So if you're a fan of cosmic treasure hunts, Ceres is surely a rich and rewarding destination. Just make sure you bring some weights on your feet so you don't fly anywhere. We just can't get enough of Mars, can we? Everyone wants to go there and astronauts are now looking at caves on the red planet where they can live once people inhabit it. The planet itself has some similar characteristics to Earth. Yeah, it's somewhat smaller than Earth, but the time it takes for the planets to revolve around themselves is also similar which is about a day. On paper, Mars might seem like a good idea given some similarities to Earth, but there are some factors we need to pay attention to before we consider stepping foot there. The temperature. Mars might look like a scorching hot planet like a freakishly large Sahara desert, but quite the opposite. It's really cold. Mars has a reputation for being a freezing, desolate, endless land that happens to have the largest mountain in our solar system thus far. So, within those mountains, astronauts and scientists are considering whether naturally built caves are the answer to our survival. Caves won't be the worst thing we'd live in considering our ancestors used to dwell in caves in communities. Logically, it's the best place to stay dry during a storm and keep warm. It's the best place for protection against predators like giant birds, elephants, and saber-toothed cats. We even had our first art shows in caves with evidence of cave art dated thousands of years ago. Caves are a good idea and they can also help us save a lot of money when establishing a colony on Mars. 
Rather than building a fresh structure in the middle of an open plain, the cave structure will help and influence the architecture, potentially saving lots and lots of money. Going to Mars will be expensive. It's already expensive sending people to the moon and launching a rocket into space. So we have to consider the logistics. Another thing to look out for is caves in the ground that are not necessarily stuck on mountains. Scientists believe that most potential places for humans to thrive are caves. These spaces are large enough to host large populations. So far, they identified nine caves as large as football fields. So what would life look like if we lived in caves on Mars? For one thing, sunlight would be hard to access. By the time we reach Mars, we would have the best technology to maximize our lifespan in a hostile environment, which means withstanding the harsh sun rays of Mars. Most likely, we would dig through the caves further underground where oxygen would be pumped for everyone to breathe. People can walk around casually, thinking they're on Earth, and to exit the caves, you would need to wear a special suit. These cave colonies would have dormitories for people to live in and special spaces for colony meetings, entertainment, grocery markets, schools, and other places that are needed to sustain a colony. There would also be indoor farms to grow crops and raise livestock. A team of experts mapped out what some of the dwellings will look like on Mars. And just like on Earth, we will have apartments for young professionals, family homes, and luxury mansions. Some of the dwelling units would be placed on the surface and not in caves. One of the key elements of the design and architecture is how to build it around the natural light to brighten up the homes. Another element is how to deflect radiation and cosmic rays. Because Mars has such a thin atmosphere, sun rays and other hazardous objects easily enter Mars. The dwelling units also have to be sturdy to protect them from severe dust storms and extreme cold temperatures. Some of the living pods or dwelling units that are for couples or singles would have tunnels leading to a shared workspace and garden. Studies show that even being in the presence of greenery can reduce stress levels significantly. And on the red planet, we would definitely need some greenery. We can expect the family homes to be built within the caves, not necessarily underground. It would be tempting to head outside with the view of Mars, but the large thick glass would prevent anything from coming in and out. Those who are underground with a view rely on LEDs and camera systems to screen the surface landscape of Mars so it acts like real windows. And if you're bored of the surface, you can always switch the channel and watch something else as you please. Maybe a flowing river surrounded by trees, or maybe a penthouse view of all of New York. The choice is yours. There would be a driveway that leads to a garage so one can enter and exit easily. There won't really be a reason to exit the cave colony except probably to visit other cave colonies. In this case, we would have highly crafted vehicles that will take people from colony to colony on the surface. The vehicles can withstand harsh temperatures and would be constantly transporting people daily. Some people might live in a certain colony and have to commute to work every day in other colonies. Humans might not have to be working in dangerous conditions or on the surface. We would have robots that will do that for us. The thing about robots is that they don't need to be human-shaped to do a job. However, before transporting humans to space, we would need to create some human-like robots and land them on Mars. With the exact physical form, we can determine what would happen to people if they were on Mars. We would have robots for specific tasks, helping us with everything. Let's not forget artificial intelligence plays a major role in monitoring the systems and updating the functionalities of the colony. It'll know when certain systems need fixing, adjusting, renewing, and changing. We also need people to keep an eye out for anything out of the ordinary and also to make sure people are behaving and not breaking the law. Getting to Mars would be the earliest obstacle we will face. We've already launched some robots to explore the terrain and conduct some studies. At first, we would send robots to test the conditions and to build most of the infrastructure. To build a proper colony, we would have to send out young couples willing to dedicate their lives to the future and the future of their children. It won't be easy. In fact, there would be a variety of people with different professions and specializations to help establish the colony. People would have to work and establish a local economy. We would need scientists, doctors, 
farmers, teachers for the children, and engineers to maintain the structure. It will take time for the colony to reach a substantial size, but it's all part of the process. Even the spaceships would need to be large and sufficient to house thousands of people traveling from Earth. Of course, by then, most of the dwelling units would have been built, and people would have already picked out their houses, depending on if they were single or if they were about to start a family. Once the colony has the necessary professionals it needs, then come the other people who wish to start their life on Mars. People would need entertainment, so musicians would find a place in the colony. We can't expect everyone to go out on a nice sunny day to the beach, but perhaps one day, when the colony is large enough, there can be an artificial body of water with the same elements as the beach. Livestock animals would also be shipped from Earth to be raised on Mars, where they can populate for our nourishment. We can also bring most of the animals and establish a wildlife sanctuary for everyone to enjoy and for the animals to thrive. For now, humans are planning on reaching the Red Planet sooner than we think. And who knows, maybe you can be one of the first people to sign up and have your own little dwelling unit far away from Earth. You wake up with a start, feeling disoriented. You were dreaming of waterfalls and green fields just a moment ago, but now your body is tingling weirdly. It feels as if you don't have enough oxygen to breathe, which makes you panic a bit. You open your eyes and look around. Oh, you're inside your sleeping capsule. Whew! Its walls are littered with different buttons and tiny screens. You press one of them, and one of the sliding panels sweeps to the side. You crawl out of your pod. The absence of your windows or any natural lighting makes you feel as if you're underground. Dozens of sleeping capsules line the walls. The door leading out of the dorm is made of metal. It looks heavy and unmovable. But once you press the button on the wall next to it, the door opens smoothly and soundlessly. After walking up a dimly lit corridor for a while, you find yourself in a smaller room. There's at least half a dozen bulky spacesuits inside. There's another door in the room. It looks even sturdier than the previous one. If you wanted to open it, it wouldn't budge. First, you need to put on one of the spacesuits. As soon as it's on, the door automatically unlocks. After waiting for a while in an airlock chamber, you finally make a step outside. You look up and see a beautiful blue orb. It seems to be glowing. It's Earth, and you're standing near your home base on the moon. You walk towards your Jeep. It looks nothing like cars on Earth, though. The vehicle you climb into is pressurized, and you can even take off your spacesuit, or at least your helmet, and ride in comfort. If you need to go outside, well, yes, you can't do it without wearing your protective gear. One of your favorite rovers, produced by Toyota, is the size of two microbuses and can easily fit two passengers and their gear. Of course, you've got the experience of riding it with three other companions, but duh, you were squashed like sardines that time. The vehicle can also unfurl solar panels to generate power. After dealing with all the tasks you had on your list, you come back to your lunar home. Unlike your house on Earth, it looks more like a castle. Due to the extreme temperatures on the moon, the lack of oxygen, the constant threat of meteorites, and the never-ending barrage of radiation from the sun, it has to be super sturdy. The thing is, on Earth, we're protected by the atmosphere. Most meteorites burn while passing through it, and it also protects Earthlings from harmful ultraviolet radiation and creates the pressure without which liquid water couldn't exist on the surface of the planet. On the moon, there's no atmosphere like that. The very weak one that exists on our natural satellite is made up of some unusual gases that haven't been found in the atmospheres of Earth, Mars, or Venus. That's why people living on the moon have to take care of these issues themselves. The first towns on the moon were built in craters and covered with protective materials, like plastic reinforced with a net made of titanium and UV-resistant superfiber. The inhabitants had to access their homes through airlock entrances dug into a mound. Bilbo Baggins would surely appreciate their aesthetics. On the moon, 
Gravity is way weaker than on our home planet. And while it makes it easier for you to walk and even run on the satellite surface, even despite your bulky spacesuit, it's not great in the long run. That's why inside lunar bases, there's an artificial gravitational field. Without it, people would have problems with coordination, balance, and orientation in space. Plus, weight-bearing bones would lose 1% to 1.5% of mineral density per month. <laughs> and there would be many other problems with health. <coughs> anyway, these days, along with old settlements located in craters, there are new towns that look like transparent glass spheres. They make a beautiful picture when you look at them while approaching the moon after visiting your family on Earth. Next to many of these domes, you can spot tall sun-reflecting towers. They can simulate the day cycle to help human bodies function properly as they used to be on our home planet. Inside, there's a breathable atmosphere and fixed atmospheric pressure. The floors look as if they're made from regular concrete, but the material used in the construction is lunar dust. A colony on Mars would cost us trillions of dollars to construct and inhabit. It would take a long time for even one cargo ship to reach the red planet. But Lunar towns are much easier to build and maintain. There are direct spaceship routes connecting the satellite with Earth. And you need just three days to travel between these two points. That's one of the reasons the colonies on the Moon are growing, developing, and changing non-stop. When people first came to the Moon with the intention of building settlements, their main concerns were producing energy and getting oxygen and water for a comfortable life. Now, you have trash can-sized nuclear reactors that provide the towns on the Moon's surface with steady power. Plus, in some regions of the satellite, for example near the South Pole, there is near-constant sunlight, which is great for getting solar power. That's one of the reasons why most lunar settlements are built in that area. Another thing that makes colonizing the Moon easier is its ice. People living on the satellite use it to make hydrogen-oxygen rocket propellant. The main way to get the raw material is by using the regolith and ice drill for the exploration of new terrains. That's a piece of equipment designed for drilling in ice-cemented regolith and rock. This fuel is then used for cargo and passenger ships, coursing between Earth and the Moon. Right now, People are trying to derive oxygen and other useful products from lunar soil. More than 40% of the lunar crust is composed of oxygen. Of course, it's bound up in minerals in combination with other elements. These compounds are called oxides. You might have heard of quartz, aka silicon dioxide. It's the second most common mineral in Earth's crust. To move from one lunar town to another, you use moon ubers taxing people and cargo. They're also called all-terrain hex-limbed extraterrestrial explorers or athletes. They have six limbs that can grip cargo and roll or step over obstacles. Plus, they can switch out quick connect gripping and digging tools if you need them. They also carry people to and from launch pads acting as lunar airport shuttles. But lunar towns aren't just placed where people live. They're innovative research hubs, both for industry and science. They're also a popular tourist destination. Plus, people living there are tirelessly working on developing and constructing a special base for future Mars missions and the exploration of distant space. But let's have a look at how it all started. For instance, how the first lunar bases were built. Private landers descended on the surface of the moon and deployed inflatable modules each around four stories tall. They served as residential areas, workspaces, industrial sites, and scientific labs. But those modules couldn't completely protect their inhabitants from harmful radiation, temperature swings, and the strikes of micrometeorites. So, people developed robots that could 3D print protective shells around each inflatable module. They used readily available regolith taken from the surface of the moon. It took the robots about three Earth months to finish solid domes. Some of these settlements were later connected with one another through a series of walkways linked to airlocks in each dome.
At the same time, some of the towns remained separated, like those constructed in craters. When you visit Earth, you often look up at the sky, searching for your new home. Some of the lunar bases are visible if you're looking at them through a telescope. Others, partially hidden underground or covered with lunar rocks and soil for better protection, are almost impossible to spot. A space settlement floating out there in the cosmos. It's not sci-fi. But, as always, there is a catch. Look at this tiny deserted asteroid. It may look lonely and barren, but if you peek inside, you'll see life blooming inside of it. These days, many people now live right inside these asteroids. It's not sci-fi. According to researchers, we might be able to create futuristic cities the size of Manhattan on gigantic space rocks. Of course, there's a catch. The asteroid we choose as our base has got to be at least a thousand feet wide. Though it's weird why life is inside this asteroid and not on its surface. You see, we can't really live right on asteroids. That's because we're not the little prince who indeed lived on an asteroid, according to the plot, but because there's too little gravity and too much radiation for us to handle if we chill outside. There are possible theoretical ways to stay on the surface, but it's going to be extravagant. So the only option is living inside asteroids. Nothing screams wildly theoretical like building an asteroid city. Living in space without any gravity isn't as romantic as it sounds. Researchers show that when people spend too much time in zero gravity, things start getting weird. Their eyeballs pop out, retinas detach, muscles shrink, and bones become as fragile as a potato chip. But imagine this, a space settlement floating out there in the cosmos. If you've watched enough sci-fi, you'd picture a massive structure spinning round and round. It spins to create gravity for all the lucky folks living inside. There's an actual prototype of this wizardry, the O'Neill Cylinder. This device is named after physicist Gerard O'Neill, who came up with the idea for NASA in the 70s. Now, there isn't a ton of data on this, but humans need roughly one-third of Earth's gravity to function properly. An O'Neill Cylinder may not be able to generate massive amounts of gravity, but the genius behind it, Mr. O'Neill himself, designed them to spin around their long axis. This device creates a gravity-like force called centrifugal force. So, if we ever get to use that, we'll be living happily on the inner surface of the cylinder, feeling pulled downward away from the center. But, as always, there is a catch. When the team crunched the numbers, they realized that the asteroids would break apart way before they could reach the speeds necessary to keep us grounded. And to make matters worse, most of these asteroids were more like loosely assembled piles of rock than a solid chunk. The small ones, like less than 6 miles across, are a mix of sand, pebbles, rocks, and boulders. They're all held together by the weak force of their own gravity. If you were to spin one of these asteroid buddies, all those parts would go flying off into space. Not cool. However, scientists didn't give up and they elaborated on the idea. They needed to find a way to keep the asteroids together. They played around with different ideas, and they produced something crazy. Now, if you were to carry all your personal belongings every day right in your hands, at some point, the situation would be out of your control. You'd have to collect all your stuff from the floor. But you're smart, and you carry a bag, right? Well, it seems that if we want to control an asteroid, all we need is a ginormous bag. But not just any bag, a massive, flexible, and super lightweight mesh bag made from teeny tiny carbon nanofibers. These fibers are like tubes that are only a few atoms wide, but boy are they strong. So once we've got this cylinder-shaped bag all set up, we can start slowly spinning the asteroid using rocket motors deep within the rubble. And as it spins faster and faster, it'll start flinging all those pebbles, rocks, and boulders. And guess what? The carbon nanowire webbing is going to go flying out with them. This bag will be expanding and expanding until it reaches its absolute limit. And then the rubble inside slams into the now super tight webbing. 
It's like a crazy explosion of debris compacting together to create this massive hollow cylinder made entirely of concrete. Once all the dust settles, you can build entire towns, cities, parks, and even farmland on the inside of the cylinder. This is like something straight out of O'Neill's designs. You can even enclose the whole inner surface with a transparent roof. Outside of this incredible living area, you've got these thick concrete walls that are like superhero shields protecting against radiation. So not only do you have this space to live in, but you're also super safe from any harmful stuff outside. We still don't have this magic bag, as those magic carbon nanowires aren't mass-produced yet. But scientists claim that, according to the laws of physics, a tiny asteroid, like a few football fields put together, can be transformed into 22 square miles of living space. As of now, about 1.5 million people are living in Manhattan, and there are like tens of thousands of asteroids just hanging around in our solar system. You do the math. Seems like everyone will have a sweet spot to crash in space. Building a city in space is no easy feat. The main challenge, still, is to create a self-sustaining closed system that can keep going for the long haul. You see, cities on Earth rely on a much larger area to survive than just their own boundaries. But in space, the farther away from external resources a space city is, the more it needs to close its loops for oxygen, water, and food. Take the ISS, for example. It's about 40% efficient in recycling oxygen. But even then, its CO2 levels are always sky-high. NASA is on the case, though, trying to figure out how to magically turn that CO2 back into oxygen. Once we've tackled the basics, like protecting ourselves from radiation, dealing with pesky gravity, and finding some air to breathe, it's time to get creative in space. Enter 3D printing and rocket engines, the dynamic duo that will pave the way for space settlements. With 3D printing, we can kiss goodbye to relying on Earth for spare parts. We'll simply whip them up locally, cutting out the middleman. We can even use 3D printers to whip up a delicious pizza in a couple of minutes. Of course, we'll need some fresh ingredients, but your dinner might just be a push button away in space. To truly thrive out there, we'll need to tap into the riches of asteroids. These celestial treasures are bursting with raw materials, perfect for creating solar arrays, building materials for our colonies, and so much more. And let's not forget about comets. These icy wonders are like cosmic water fountains, providing us with precious H2O for drinking, bathing, and even shielding ourselves from radiation. Plus, we can use that water to produce hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel and fuel cells. So, let's say we pull this off. Can you imagine people living or born in space might end up being different from you and me? Like if humans can have babies up there, these space colonies might develop some cool cultures. They might even come up with their own languages, and get this, they could even evolve new physical traits. It's wild to think that just after 300 years, a colony of 2,000 people could look and act so differently from us. They might have different hair textures, skin types, and even be taller or more slender to deal with that low-gravity situation. We might even develop new organs to protect us from cosmic rays. Or we'll have gill-like structures to breathe carbon dioxide. Hey, I know, it sounds crazy. But these scientists are working on developing these carbon nanotubes as we speak. So maybe one day, we'll be living it up on our very own asteroid crib. It might seem like asteroid cities are just too far-fetched, but let's take a trip back in time for a moment. In 1900, no one had ever flown in an airplane. But today, thousands of people are zooming through the sky, comfortably seated in chairs, traveling at hundreds of miles an hour high above the ground, unaware that their luggage is on another plane going to a different destination. Ah well, 